The committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time, and all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is for the purpose of receiving the semi-annual testimony of the chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System on Monetary Policy and the State of the Economy. I now recognize myself for three and a half minutes to give an opening statement. Notwithstanding the greatest monetary and fiscal stimulus in our nation's history, the economy has limped along for eight years, averaging only 1.6 percent GDP growth. Wages remain stagnant and personal savings failed to recover from the 2008 financial crisis. A new phrase was coined by left-leaning academics in an attempt to rationalize the phenomena, namely secular stagnation. A far more accurate and descriptive phrase, though, is high taxes and heavy-handed regulatory policy. Fortunately, with the election of Donald Trump and the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that has all changed. Unemployment is now at a 17-year low. Wage growth is the fastest in almost a decade, and companies all over America are now announcing bonuses to their employees and expansions in their communities. Economic growth is once again averaging 3%. However, there are some concerns. We all recognize that there has been great volatility in our equity markets recently, although I note the S&P 500 is still up more than 14 percent since last year. There is clearly concern now whether the Fed can successfully unwind a historically unbalanced balance sheet after a decade of radically unconventional monetary policy and artificially low interest rates. This was not particularly an issue when the economy was stuck in low gear, but now that the economic transmission has been shifted into high gear, it clearly is an issue. So with that backdrop, we welcome you, Chairman Powell, to your first of many Humphrey Hawkins hearings. Please know we are all rooting for you, for much is at stake. And as we begin a new era in Federal Reserve leadership, I think it is a good time to reestablish congressional expectations. Now more than ever, the Fed must commit to a credible, orderly, and well-communicated normalization plan. The Fed must do an even better job of communi communicating clearly to market participants all the variables used to conduct monetary policy and their relative weightings and interactions. And certainly, it is a positive sign that the Fed has begun to compare their policies with known policy rules so that the public can better evaluate their performance. Next, monetary policy must remain independent, but the Fed must also remain accountable to Congress, which incidentally created it and has the responsibility of coining money and regulating its value under our Constitution. Furthermore, it is critical that the Fed stays in their lane. Interest on reserves, especially excess reserves, is not only fueling a much more improvisational monetary policy, but it has fueled a distortionary balance sheet that has clearly allowed the Fed into credit allocation policy where it does not have business. Credit policies are the purview of Congress, not the Fed. When Congress granted the Fed the power to pay interest on reserves, it was never contemplated or articulated that IOER might be used to supplant FOMC. And if the Fed continues to do so, I fear that its independence could be eroded. Finally, in addition to its monetary policy responsibilities, we all know the Fed has an outsized prudential regulator role, vastly expanded by Dodd-Frank. This responsibility is clearly not designed to be independent of Congress and must be made subject to appropriations, as are other prudential regulators. Additionally, formal rulemaking must not be issued for de facto rulemaking through guidance, and all formal rulemaking must be subject to rigorous statutory cost-benefit analysis so as to not unduly hamper economic growth and the hopes and dreams of millions. In closing, regardless of the exigencies of 2008, monetary policy is not and can never be a substitute for sound fiscal policy. Chairman Powell, we look forward to a prudent path to normalization where interest rates are once again market-based and credit is allocated to its <coughs> most efficient use. I now yield four minutes to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, uh, Chairman Powell. I look forward to your testimony today on monetary policy, recent economic developments, and the outlook for our economy. I am concerned that the hard-earned economic recovery 
which came as a result of policies and reforms put in place by President Obama, Democrats in Congress, and the Federal Reserve will be undermined by the reckless and misguided policies of this president and our congressional Republicans. Uh, this president and his allies in Congress are working every day to roll back the critical protections for consumers, investors, and the economy that Democrats put in place in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. As they move to take an ax to Dodd-Frank, they seemingly have forgotten about the tremendous economic harm that resulted from the financial crisis and appear to be perfectly willing to pave the way right to another crisis. With their tax scam, Republicans have engineered a massive giveaway to corporations and the ultra-rich at the expense of hardworking Americans. The tax scam balloons the national debt by $1.8 trillion, gives corporations a $1.3 trillion tax break, and will eventually raise taxes on 86 million American families. Despite the huge windfall for corporations, most are not raising wages, but are instead buying back their own stock to boost share prices. Some corporations are given one-time bonuses for optics, but these one-time bonuses represent a tiny fraction of the windfall the corporations will pocket. On top of that, the latest Trump budget request is again a cruel senseless proposal that would be deeply harmful to millions of families, seniors, veterans, and persons with disabilities. The budget request slashes the social safety net cutting billions of dollars in funding for supplemental nutrition assistance in health care and housing programs. These policies show that Donald Trump simply has no interest in standing up for Americans who need a hand up. Instead, he has put forth a series of harmful policies that tell families and communities that they are on their own. Our majority colleagues have also launched a full-fledged legislative assault on the Federal Reserve. The majority is pushing damaging legislative proposals that roll back constraints on the influence of commercial banks within the Federal Reserve system, eliminate tools that provided critical that, pro that proved, I'm sorry, critical to the Federal Reserve's support of the economy following the financial crisis, undermine the Federal Reserve's focus on employment, and eliminate its independence from the broken congressional appropriations process. The majority is also using the Federal Reserve as a piggy bank to pay for the cost of legislation, like the latest short-term spending measure, and now H.R. 4296, which will be on the floor today. These Republican efforts to undermine the Fed diminish its ability to support American workers if we face another crisis. Chairman Powell, I look forward to hearing your views on the economy and the path to sustaining the economic progress that was set in motion during the Obama administration. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, the chairman of the Monetary Policy and Trade Subcommittee for one and a half minutes. Welcome, Chairman Powell. Uh, since the 2007 and 2009 financial crisis, the Federal Reserve's distortionary balance sheet has exploded from just under $1 trillion to more than $4.5 trillion, injecting new and unknown risks into the economy. Clearly, whether you believe this unprecedented government intervention into our economy had merit or not, it has distorted prices of key assets like housing, stocks, bonds, and treasury. That, treasuries. That was the intention. Fortunately, the Fed has begun to unwind these distortions, and I hope that they stick to their plan, enabling a more free market environment that, like the recent tax cuts and regulatory relief, will help foster economic growth and opportunity for all. Over recent weeks, we have seen more than usual levels of market volatility. Without question, Chairman Powell, this volatility is attributable, attributable to the fact that no Fed chairman has ever inherited the task you have before you, the job of unwinding the most unprecedented and unconventional monetary experiment in the history of central banking. Your task is to continue to unwind the Fed's asset purchases, gradually and predictably return to market-based interest rates, and remove monetary distortions from the economy that with without producing excessive market disruption. This is a serious responsibility, but at least the Fed now has the backdrop of a strong economy and faster economic growth from tax cuts 
uh, so that it can achieve this very difficult task. I personally want to commend you, Chairman Powell, for leading the way on normalization, and I encourage you to continue in this pursuit. I also commend your commitment to tailoring financial regulations for community financial institutions and right-sizing our regulations. I look forward to your testimony and wish you the best. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes a gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, the ranking member of the Monetary Policy and Trade Subcommittee, for one minute. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for attending today. I look forward to your testimony and getting to know you through your tenure as chairman. You're taking over um, the Federal Reserve at a very precarious time, and your predecessor has talked about slowly tightening rates as employment has improved and thinking was a return to normalcy. So I'm interested in hearing if that means an emphasis on increasing uh, rates and or unwinding the portfolio. Um, <clears throat> your tenure comes at a time when the GOP tax bill will only make your tasks more difficult, I believe, uh, as changes to health care may increase inflation for coverage. The GOP tax bill is a windfall for shareholders that will untether the real economy that most of us live in uh, as distinct from Wall Street, leaving you kind of stuck between competing problems, a contracting real economy and growing asset bubbles with minimum room to lower rates if necessary. I, I guess we should thank Dodd-Frank that has buttressed the financial system and we should hold on for perhaps a bumpy ride. Uh, I hope your term is successful and I look forward to your testimony and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentlelady has expired. Today, we welcome the testimony of the Honorable Jerome H. Powell. This is the first time that Chairman Powell has appeared before this committee. It will not be the last time he appears before this committee. Chairman Powell took office as chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System on February 5, 2018, for a four-year term. He has previously served as a member of the Board of Governors and took office on May 25, 2012. Mr. Powell also serves as chairman of the Federal Open Market Committee. Prior to his appointment to the board, Chairman Powell was a visiting scholar at the Bipartisan Policy Center as well as a partner of the Carlisle Group. Chairman Powell has previously served as an assistant secretary and as an undersecretary of Treasury under President George H.W. Bush. Prior to joining the administration, he worked as an attorney and an investment banker in New York. Chairman Powell received an A.B. in politics from Princeton University and earned a law degree from Georgetown University, where he was the editor-in-chief of the Georgetown Law Journal. Without objection, the witness's written statement will be made part of the record. Chairman Powell, again, welcome, and you are now recognized to give an oral presentation of your testimony. You're going to have to hit the microphone, though. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Ranking Member Waters and members of the committee. I'm pleased today to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report to the Congress. On the occasion of my first appearance before this committee as chairman of the Federal Reserve, I want to begin by expressing my appreciation for my predecessor, Chair Janet Yellen, and her important contributions. During her term as chair, the economy continued to strengthen and Federal Reserve policymakers began to normalize both the level of interest rates and the size of the balance sheet. Together, Chair Yellen and I have worked to ensure a smooth leadership transition and provide for continuity in monetary policy. I'd also like to express my appreciation for my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. And finally, I, I want to affirm my continued support for the objectives assigned to us by Congress maximum employment and price stability, and for transparency about the Federal Reserve's policies and programs. Transparency is the foundation for our accountability, and I am committed to clearly explaining what we are doing and why we are doing it. Today, I will briefly discuss the current economic situation and outlook before turning to monetary policy. The U.S. economy grew at a solid pace over the second half of 2017 and into this year. Monthly job gains averaged 179,000 uh, from July through December, and payrolls rose an additional 200,000 in January. This pace of job growth was sufficient to push the unemployment rate down to 4.1 percent, about three-quarters of a percentage point below that of a year earlier, and the lowest rate since December of 2000. In addition, the labor force participation rate remained roughly unchanged on net, as it has for the past several years, and that is a sign of job market strength 
given that retiring baby boomers are putting downward pressure on the participation rate. Strong job gains in recent years have led to widespread reductions in unemployment across the income spectrum and for all major demographic groups. For example, the unemployment rate for adults without a high school education has fallen from about 15% in 2009 to 5.5% in January of this year, while the jobless rate for those with a college degree has moved down from 5% to 2% over the same period. In addition, unemployment rates for African Americans and Hispanics are now at or below rates seen before the recession, although they are still significantly above the rate for whites. Wages have continued to grow moderately with a modest acceleration in some measures, although the extent of the pickup in wages likely has been damped in part by the weak pace of productivity growth in recent years. Turning from the labor market to production, uh, inflation-adjusted GDP rose at an annual rate of about 3 percent in the second half of 2017, a full percentage point faster than its pace in the first half of the year. Economic growth in the second half was led by solid gains in consumer spending, supported by rising household incomes and wealth and upbeat sentiment. In addition, Growth in business investments stepped up sharply last year, which should support higher productivity growth in time. The housing market has continued to improve slowly. Economic activity abroad has also been solid in recent quarters, and the associated strengthening in demand for U.S. exports has provided considerable support, considerable support for our manufacturing industry. Against this backdrop of solid growth and a strong labor market, inflation has been low and stable. In fact, inflation has continued to run below the 2 percent rate that the FOMC judges to be most consistent over the long run with our congressional mandate. Overall consumer prices, as measured by the Price Index for Personal Consumption Expenditures, or PCE, inflation as we say, increased 1.7 percent in the 12 months ending in December, about the same as in 2016. The core PCE price index, which excludes the prices of energy and food items and is a better indicator of future inflation, rose 1.5 percent over the same period, somewhat less than in the previous year. We continue to view some of the short for shortfall in inflation last year as likely reflecting transitory influences that we do not expect will repeat. Consistent with this view, the monthly readings were a little bit higher toward the end of the year than in earlier months. After substantially easing during 2017, financial conditions in the United States have reversed some of that easing over the past month. At this point, we do not see these developments as weighing heavily on the outlook for economic activity, the labor market, or inflation. Indeed, the economic outlook remains strong. The robust job market should continue to support growth in household incomes and consumer spending. Solid economic growth among our trading partners should lead to further gains in U.S. exports and upbeat business sentiment and strong sales growth will likely continue to boost business investment. Moreover, fiscal policy has become more stimulative. In this environment, we anticipate that inflation on a 12-month basis will move up this year and stabilize around the Committee's 2 percent objective over the medium term. Wages should increase at a faster pace as well. The Committee views the near-term risks to the economic outlook as roughly balanced but will continue to monitor inflation developments closely. Turning to monetary policy, the Congress has assigned us the goals of promoting maximum employment and stable prices. Over the second half of 2017, the FOMC continued to gradually reduce monetary policy accommodation. Specifically, we raised the target rate for the federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point at our December meeting, bringing the target to a range of one and a quarter percent to one and a half percent. In addition, in October, we initiated a balance sheet normalization program to gradually reduce our securities holdings, and that program has proceeded quite smoothly. These interest rate and balance sheet actions reflect the Committee's view that gradually reducing monetary policy accommodation will sustain a strong labor market while fostering a return of inflation to 2 percent. Engaging the appropriate path for monetary policy over the next few years, the FOMC will continue to strike a balance between avoiding an overheated economy and bringing PCE price inflation to 2 percent on a sustained basis. 
While many factors shape the economic outlook, some of the headwinds the U.S. economy faced in previous years have turned into tailwinds. In particular, fiscal policy has become more stimulative, and foreign demand for U.S. exports is on a firmer trajectory. Despite the recent volatility, financial conditions remain accommodative. At the same time, inflation remains below our 2 percent longer run objective. In the Committee's view, further gradual increases in the federal funds rate will best promote attainment of both of our objectives. As always, the path of monetary policy will depend on the economic outlook as informed by incoming data. In evaluating the stance of monetary policy, the FOMC routinely conducts monetary policy rules that connect prescriptions for the policy rate with variables associated with our mandated objectives. Personally, I find these rule prescriptions quite helpful. Careful judgments are required about the measurement of the variables used in these rules, as well as about the implication of the many issues that the rules do not take into account. I'd like to note that this monetary policy report provides further discussion of policy rules and their role in our policy process, extending the analysis we introduced last July. Thank you very much, and I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman Powell. The chair now yields to himself for five minutes. Chairman Powell, in your statement, you used the term normalization. So I'd like to explore that for a moment, and particularly with respect to interest on excess reserves. Is our expectation, should it be, that IOER is the new primary monetary policy tool, or will it instead be the fire extinguisher behind the glass that you break out in times of emergency? What should be our expectation? Mr. Chairman, uh, interest on excess reserves is currently, as you know, the principal policy tool that we use to keep the federal funds rate in, in the range that we designate. And uh, we have not made a decision in the longer run whether that will continue to be our framework or whether we will return to something more like what we did before the crisis. And I don't have a schedule for, I don't expect to be returning to that uh, decision in the near term. I would just say that our, our current approach seems to be working very well. It gives us control over rates and the market seems to understand it. So it remains an open question. In the long run, the long run framework, operating framework, does remain open, yes. Okay. Well, as you heard in my opening statement, it still remains a concern. Uh, you would be hard pressed to find in the congressional record or any testimony from members of the Federal Reserve at the time Congress granted this power, that it would be used to supplant open market operations of the FOMC. So uh, I trust we will be having further discussions about that. With respect to normalization, I think you have said uh, publicly that you expect the new normal with respect to the size of the balance sheet to be roughly two and a half to three trillion and get there over three to four years. Do I understand that correctly, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay, as I understand it, though, I, I've not been able to see on the public record the expectation with respect to the composition of the balance sheet. And I believe that currently you're carrying 2.4 trillion of treasuries, 1.8 of mortgage-backed securities. Is our expectation, that's roughly back of the envelope, one-third, two-thirds ratio. Is it your intention to keep that same ratio of mortgage-backed securities? Uh, again, many of us are concerned about the possibility of the Fed involved in credit allocation decisions. Um, because right now, I don't really see a glide path to a Treasury's only balance sheet. Uh, no, sir. Our, our intention over the, over the long term is that the balance sheet would be no larger than it needs to be to implement monetary policy and that it would consist primarily of Treasury securities. As you know, we purchased the mortgage-backed securities in the aftermath of the crisis. That was uh, an unusual uh, practice, and it was something uh, that we did in unusual circumstances, and those will run off over time, and uh, I don't expect that we would use that tool again other than in a, in a very severe situation. The monetary policy report that came out days ago shows the um, balance sheet roll-off caps. What I'm having a little trouble with is, as I look at the charts in the report, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't know, you don't seem to have sufficient MBS redemptions that allow you to reach your $20 billion runoff pace. So as I read the charts, I think the expectation is by the end of the year, we're looking at a $50 billion 
balance sheet roll off, but as of today, I don't think you have sufficient treasuries and MBS to do that. So how do you achieve it? Well, um, in the case of mortgage-backed securities, the, the roll-off is less predictable. Of course, with, with treasuries, you know when they're going to mature, and you can really see what that roll-off is going to be. With mortgage-backed securities, roll-off will depend on the level of interest rates and the level of people refinancing their mortgages. So as rates go up, uh, refis will go down, and, uh, and you, you'll see slower roll-off. But should the public expect by years in a $50 billion um, roll-off? No, I, I would say that the public should expect that there will be a consistent, substantial roll-off this year and the next year, that over the period of maybe four years, we'll get us back to something approaching a new normal. I don't know that you can say it'll be... But we don't know the exact pace. Yeah, and I, I don't think okay. that the, the caps are not going to be binding in the case of the NBA. Okay, well, my, my time is starting to wind down. I'd like to <clears throat> explore inflation targeting. So in your testimony, it appears the Fed is keeping to their 2 percent inflation target. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm still trying to I struggle with how this is commensurate with a statutory mandate for achieving price stability. But I also saw from the FOMC minutes, uh, the most recent uh, minutes, that there was at least discussion about moving from the 2 percent target to a target range. At least 2 percent is a linear function. A range obviously is not. And so I'm really struggling with how is this commensurate with price stability, and also, as you know, some commentators are calling for a 3 percent, 4 percent target. Uh, so two questions. Number one, uh, do we have an expectation the Fed will move from its 2 percent target? And at some point, at 3 percent, 4 percent, 5 percent inflation targeting, have you violated your price stability mandate? Um, our current uh, framework says that uh, the committee would be concerned with sustained or persistent deviations of inflation above or below 2 percent. So we understand that inflation is going to be buffeted by various factors and that it may not be exactly at 2 percent. It'll be above and it'll be, be below. And we, we see it as a symmetric objective. And I would say that framework is working. market understands it. We've, uh, we've, been, we've been trying to, to get up to 2 percent. Uh, but generally speaking, inflation has been low. and, and um, stable for 15 or 20 years now. My time has long since expired. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Chairman Powell, with a permanent voting seat on uh, the FOMAC and its role in supervising some of the largest and most complex financial institutions in the country, <clears throat> the president of the New York Federal Reserve has one of the most important economic policy-making roles in the nation. As you know, Bill Dudley will step down this year, and the search for his replacement is underway. Historically, the New York Fed's close proximity to Wall Street has led to the selection <coughs> of an individual with close ties to the financial sector. In your view, how important is it that the individual chosen is a diverse candidate with demonstrated independence from Wall Street and a strong commitment to the Fed's maximum employment mandate and regulatory responsibilities? What steps is the board taking to ensure that candidates from diverse gender, racial, and ethnic backgrounds are given due consideration? If diverse candidates are not afforded due consideration, are you prepared to exercise your power as chair to reject such candidates to serve as the next president of the New York Fed? I know you have a lot on your plate, but I have to put this uh, question to you uh, because we've got to do better uh, about diversity, in particular at the highest levels. Not only am I looking at what's happening with the New York Fed and the possibility there, uh, we have to look at our own Fed and think about how diverse it is it at the top uh, levels, management levels. So help me out. What do you think about this? Thank you, Ranking Member Waters. I, um, I've been involved. This, this is the seventh process to select a Reserve Bank president that I've been involved in since I joined the Fed in 2012. So I can, I, I'm very familiar with the way the process works. And um, so we always uh, insist that the search committee, which is, consists of the BNC directors of the Reserve Bank, hire a national search firm. And we always insist, and, and they don't need to be pushed into this. This is something they want to do. We always insist that there's a, a highly diverse candidate pool and that diverse candidates are given serious consideration and every chance to 
to become the successful uh, participant in that process. So I can absolutely guarantee you that that will continue to be the case. We will always have diverse candidates. They will always have a fair shot. Uh, I cannot in any individual case guarantee that there will be a diverse outcome, but I can guarantee you that the process will always be, will be working in that direction. I appreciate that, and I'm sure that you're committed to that, uh, but the diverse candidate question is a question that many of us have, and we don't know uh, that there has been consideration for diverse candidates um, uh, with these uh, very, very important positions. And I'm wondering, where do the recommendations come from? How is the outreach done? And what, how can you ensure that there are diverse candidates to be considered? Different reserve banks have done new and different things, and we've really raised our game in this area. So for example, the New York Fed has done extensive re uh, re outreach to con community groups and, um, you know, of that nature, universities and all sorts of things ar around the New York region and around the nation. In addition, the, the national search firms have a, a very large presence in the candidate population and know, know who's out there and know who would be a good candidate. They're always trying to find new candidates, and we are too. So it's something we work, work very hard at and uh, are always interested in having, uh, having new ideas for, for, for qualified candidates as well. So we invite the, the general public generally to offer their thoughts as well as some of the interest groups. Uh, you know, there uh, is an organization, maybe more than one, of, uh, that's made up of minorities in financial services uh, that include everything from um, uh, those who are, you know, doing management uh, in the financial services industry, working with hedge funds, with uh, equity firms, et cetera. Have you reached out to those firms? Not you, but do you know if those firms have been contacted? I know that um, that our search committees and our, our headhunters have reached out to many, many groups of that nature. How can I follow up on that? And is it possible that those of us who know about these organizations can uh, ask them if they have been contacted? And if not, how can we refer them? Well, I'll, we'll be happy to provide you with the contact person at the New York Fed who's uh, responsible for the current search. And in case of any future service, searches, we'll be able to do the same. Well, I, would, uh, I will follow up on that, and I thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. The lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, chairman of our Monetary Policy Subcommittee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Powell, congratulations again on your confirmation. I appreciate your commitment in our conversations to transparency and your demonstration of that commitment to date to clearly communicate the, the Fed's uh, monetary policy trajectory. Um, uh, you have noted on uh, numerous occasions that the remaining slack that may exist in the labor market is at least in part attributable to stagnant wage growth. And in your confirmation hearing, um, uh, a uh, senator on the banking committee cited a 2016 Fed research paper concluding that corporate tax cuts do not translate into higher wages. But we have seen a wave of corporate announcements um, of bonuses and raises since the tax cuts were enacted, specifically over four million workers and counting have received over three billion dollars in bonuses and raises during the last eight weeks. And the Labor Department recently announced the largest increase in wages since the end of the recession. Based on these numbers, um, is the senator in question and are the Fed researchers that he cites, uh, are they wrong and have tax cuts in fact help increase wages as your as your testimony indicates that wages should be increasing at a faster pace as a result of a more stimulative fiscal policy. Thank you, Chairman Barr. Uh, it's very hard to, to trace through the, the effects of, of a change in tax policy into things like wage growth in the economy, but let me, let me try. Um, so if lower corporate taxes should lead to higher investment, and the, the effect is not uh, uh, um, easy to estimate, but you would think, and, and the studies find, that it should lead to higher investment. Higher investment should lead to higher productivity over time, and higher productivity should lead to higher wages over time. It's very hard to put your hands on exactly how much that would be, but um, 
Higher productivity, of course, is very, very welcome and will be driven by higher investment. And clearly, the, the wave of bonuses and raises and the announcements certainly suggest uh, that, that uh, there is upward pressure on wages as a result of these tax cuts. In a 2015 speech, you expressed concern that quantitative easing and unconventional monetary accommodation could fuel dangerous risk-taking. Specifically, you said, quote, the current extended period of very low nominal rates calls for a high degree of vigilance, unquote. Can you elaborate and what specific risks have been created that the Fed now has to watch? Well, I, I do think it's, uh, this is a time when we need to be alert to buildup of uh, either financial imbalances or, or to uh, inflation building up. We don't really see those right now. I think I also said that in my 2015 speech. But um, if, if you look at the financial stability uh, situation broadly, we do see some high asset prices. What we don't see is the buildup of leverage among households. We don't see, we see the banking system and the financial system generally as being, you know, very resilient. So I think the financial stability picture shows it at most modest risks. If I could point out maybe um, a, a possible risk that's out there and have you re react to it um, that was created by the unconventional monetary policy. As you know, some have blamed the Fed for contributing to the 2008 financial crisis by producing an inverted yield curve where short-term interest rates exceeded long-term uh, rates. At the beginning of 2011, the spread between the 10-year and 2-year Treasury notes was almost 3 percent. But as of February of this year, that same spread has been whittled down to a mere half percent. And this is a 450 percent drop. Given a flattening yield curve and economic conditions that you concede call for raising the Fed funds rate, how will the Fed avoid another inverted yield curve? And are there any plans within the balance sheet normalization strategy to roll off longer-term assets more quickly to counteract that flattening yield curve? Uh, you know, f flattening of yield curves in the past has been, a, has been a sort of a precursor of recessions, but largely because in many prior recessions, the Fed had to raise rates quickly to, you know, to hold inflation down. That's not the situation we have now. It's very typical for uh, the yield curve to flatten as short-term rates come up, as the economy strengthens, and I don't see uh, a particularly large. There's, there's always a risk of, an, of, of, uh, of a recession at any given point in time. I don't see it as at all high at the moment. I don't either, but it is a risk that uh, normalization after this unprecedented uh, unconventional policy is created. And, and to dovetail off of what the chairman's uh, point was in terms of the roll-off strategy, it would be important if there are not enough maturing mortgage-backed securities um, that, that mature in order for the Fed to actually hit its monetary roll-off targets. And so to that end, to avoid an inverted yield curve, do you anticipate the perhaps selling assets? No, I, I think uh, I, I certainly feel that our uh, our balance sheet normalization plan was carefully crafted and carefully rolled out, and the markets took it without much of a reaction. And I think uh, I, I would have little inclination to change the, the general parameters of it. Thank you. My time has expired. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, ranking member of our Capital Markets Subcommittee. Thank you, uh, Chairman Powell. The Fed's. Uh, median projection is for three interest rate increases in 2018. What would cause you to raise rates more than three times this year? Would you have to see a material increase in inflation, faster GDP growth, a higher wage growth? What would cause you to raise rates more? Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Uh, you're, you're right that um, Every quarter, each participant in the FOMC submits a projection of what they feel is going to happen in the economy and also their projection for appropriate monetary policy. And at the December meeting, the median participant uh, called for three rate increases in 2018. Now, since then, we, we, we will submit another projection, all of us, uh, in three weeks. But since then, what we've seen uh, is incoming data that su suggests a strengthening in the economy. We've seen continuing strength in the labor market. We've seen some data that will, in my case, uh, add some confidence to uh, my view that inflation is moving up to target. We've also seen continued strength around the globe. And we've seen uh, fiscal policy become more stimulative. So I think each of us is going to be taking uh, the developments between since the December meeting into account and writing down our new rate pass as we, as we go into the March meeting. And I wouldn't want to prejudge that. Okay. And, and, and as you know, the last time the Fed released its uh, projections for the pace of 
interest rate increases was in mid-December, and since then we've had two major financial events. One was the tax reform legislation, and the other was the major budget agreement. Uh, so my question is, has your outlook for how quickly the Fed should tighten monetary policy changed in light of tax reform and, and budget agreement? So I would say that the out, my, out, my personal outlook for the economy has, has strengthened since December. And uh, again, each member of the FOMC is going to be writing down a new set of projections and a new estimate of appropriate monetary policy as we go into the March meeting, which begins three weeks, weeks from today. And so uh, I wouldn't want to prejudge uh, that, uh, that new set of projections, but we'll be taking into account everything that's happened since December. And, and yesterday, the Fed Governor Quarles, who's leading the Fed's review of post-crisis regulations, stated, and I quote, we are not looking to relax a regulation, end quote. He also said, and I quote, we're not looking to reduce capital for banks, end quote. Uh, do you agree with the Governor Quarles that your goal is not to either relax regulations or to reduce banks' capital requirements? And Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to places Comments uh, in the record? Without objection. The way, the way I think about it is this. We, um, we have several sort of primary pillars of, of post-crisis financial regulation that we want to strengthen and protect. And those are uh, high risk-based capital, um, high liquidity, stress testing, and resolution. And we want to make sure that we keep those strong and, by the way, transparent as they apply particularly to our largest institutions. I think as we move down into smaller and, and uh, smaller institutions down to the community banks. We want to make absolutely sure that we've tailored regulation so that we are not, we're achieving our safety and soundness goals without, without uh, 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 creating excessive burden. And that's really the way I think about what we're doing. And, and, and lastly, uh, Chairman Powell, uh, last week several academics published a paper claiming that the Fed's quantitative easing programs during the Great Recession were largely ineffective at stimulating the economy. New York Fed uh, President Dudley and Boston Fed President Rosengreen uh, disagreed and said that they thought that uh, quantitative easing had been effective. So my, my, my question to you is, do you think the Fed's quantitative easing program was effective? And do you believe the Fed should keep this tool in its toolbox for future challenges? I, I do think our post-crisis post policies were effective. Um, and I, I haven't carefully studied that report yet, but let me say that what these reports try to do is they try to identify the surprise element in a particular Fed announcement and isolate that from what was already priced into the market. So most, of, most things that happen on announcement, they are already priced in. It's very hard to isolate that surprise element. And this paper takes a different way of doing that and comes up with the answer it comes in. Overwhelmingly, studies of the effects of, of asset purchase programs suggest that asset purchase programs did their job, which was to create downward pressure on longer term interest rates through the term premium. And uh, so I would say that that, that is, uh, very likely. Okay. Thank you. My time is up. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, chairman of our Financial <coughs> Institutions <coughs> Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Chairman Powell. Congratulations, and uh, it's nice to see a banker actually being the, the chief banker of this country instead of an economist. Uh, to me, I think we get to look at some different policies, and I think we have a different perspective, and I think that's healthy. So. Um, <coughs> just want to start by talking about leverage lending a little bit. Uh, I want to follow up on the GAO, which determined that agency leverage lending guidance is a, is a rule under the Congressional Review Act and is therefore ineffective because it was never submitted to Congress. As I pointed out in the past, the same would presumably be true for other agency guidance. I've heard reports from banks that many of them have outstanding matters requiring attention or MRAs based on such guidance and that they are still being told either by examiners or the compliance departments to treat guidance as binding regulations. So although no one seems to be disputing GAO's conclusion, the word does, appear to not, does not appear to be getting out. Would you agree that rules are rules and guidance is guidance and guidance is not binding? Yes, Mr. Lukemeyer, I, I would agree absolutely with that. And I think in the case of a leveraged lending guidance, we, we do 
accept and understand that, it, that that's non-binding guidance. And in fact, since the GAO ruling, we've made it a point to go out and make sure that that message is getting out to supervisors <laughs> of banks. And we're also thinking of, um, we're, we're in discussions and thinking about other ways we can uh, underscore that, perhaps putting it out for, for further comment. Well, I just left another meeting uh, before I got here of, of a group of bankers from one of the states around the country, and we were discussing issues similar to this with regards to uh, the culture within agencies and the ability of uh, change to be taking place. Uh, even though we change the head of the agency, sometimes the message doesn't get all the way to the bottom. And when I made that comment, I saw a lot of heads nodding in the audience. You know, there's concern that while uh, the leadership has changed, good intentions may be there, that uh, again, this needs to filter down all the way through the entire agency and, and an understanding needs to take place by everybody that this is a, a new way of doing business, that guidance is guidance, rules are rules, and there's a big difference between how they're adjudicated and administered and enforced by the, by the body itself. So I sure appreciate you taking that into consideration. It's an important point, and it's, it's a feature of our, uh, of our distributed Federal Reserve System, of which I'm a big supporter of the structure of our system. And I think we know how to manage that problem, and I think we actually do a pretty good job at it, and uh, we're, we're going to continue to try to do the best job we can. We are uh, the heads of supervision at all the Reserve Banks are in close and constant con uh, you know, conversation and discussion with, uh, with uh, Vice Chair Quarles and others at the board, and I do think, I, I don't sense any reluctance to to engage in those discussions, and I, and I think it's on us to communicate well and successfully, and we'll try to do that. Well, I look forward to working with you on that, because I told the bankers when I left them, as you see a problem, let me know, because I've got a chance to talk to Mr. Powell myself here this morning, so we'll, we'll carry the message. Uh, thank you for that. <clears throat> with regards to uh, data security uh, and cybersecurity, this is an issue that we're working on right now. Uh, my committee, my subcommittee, has got a bill that we're putting together. Uh, data security, cybersecurity threats have the potential to wreck our, uh, our economy, to wreak havoc with it. Uh, we subject financial companies to an absurd maze of cybersecurity regulations. The Federal Reserve is one of the many entities that examines for cybersecurity. Uh, there is zero harmonization between the agencies. The result is that financial firms spend thousands of hours complying with regulations rather than actually protecting their systems and their customers. Do you see this as a problem? Well, I do. I think cybersecurity overall is one of, the, one of the really significant threats, and we can never feel like we've done enough to deal with it. We try to harmonize through the FIFIAC process our, our supervisory guidance on what we expect from firms uh, on cybersecurity issues and data, data safety and that kind of thing. I'm sure we can do a better job, and we're, we're committed to trying. Well, I know that's an issue that uh, the financial institutions in particular are sort of right in the crosshairs of this because of the amount of personal data that they hold and, and the risk that's there. Uh, they're an easy target. Uh, so we want to make sure that we work on that issue and work with you. Um, you know, you set in a position where you can harmonize those rules and regulations, I think, pretty easily with the different discussions and different groups of, of uh, uh, regulatory agencies that uh, actually meet on a regular basis discussing things. Is this ever discussed at all in your, in your meetings with uh, the Fed, the Treasury, FDIC, uh, you know, Comptroller, F, uh, FCFPB, any of those meetings? Is this ever discussed uh, at length? Yes, it is. In fact, there's a, there's a group chaired by, the, um, by Treasury which focuses on uh, cybersecurity issues, which the chair, I haven't attended one of those yet, but, uh, but as, as chair, I will, will attend those meetings. It's, it's certainly a very big focus uh, for Treasury and for us. My time's expiring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. Chairman Powell, welcome. As the chair point of our committee points out, you are required to be independent and accountable. You are also required to be tall and short. Um, your opening statement uh, point, uh, uh, mentions great exports, but you don't mention that our trade deficit has gone up by $60 billion in the last year. And I would point out that the entire economic establishment in this country has made it almost uh, prohibited to discuss the trade deficit. And when and that's why we elected, that's why the country elected Donald Trump president. Um, now, the chair of the subcommittee boasts that uh, we had a good economy in 2017. He's right. We had Obama's fiscal policies, Obama's tax policies, Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, Janet Yellen's monetary policies, and her big balance sheet, and we had a great year. 
As a matter of fact, we've been on a roll since 2011. We were closing in on having a high enough employment rate so that we'd have uh, uh, a labor shortage and higher wages. We were going well. And so instead of continuing to be on a roll, we've abandoned those policies and adopted a profligate tax and spending policy, uh, throwing away the budget caps, 1.5 trillion plus interest of the debt uh, from the tax bill. But I think that we will still do well because our scientists, our entrepreneurs, and our workers are the best in the world and they'll make up for all the mistakes we're making here in Washington. Uh, I see uh, behind you, sir, the green shirts that call for full employment. And uh, it's not enough to go with the economist definition of full employment, say 4%. We need real full employment that causes a labor shortage and desperate employers bidding up the price of labor. Um, and that is also consistent with the fact that many economists are saying that you should be aiming not for 2%, but 2.5% inflation. That's the kind of expansionary economy that uh, will allow these folks to come back in fancy polo shirts with the same slogan on it in a couple years from now. Now, when uh, we talk about some workers getting a $1,000 bonus, uh, yeah, if you have, but a family of five's share of the increase in the national debt from the tax bill is $26,000. What greater proof do we need of the need for financial literacy in this country than that some charlatan can say, here's the deal, I'll give you $1,000, it's money in your pocket, and we'll just slap a $26,000 mortgage on your future. Now, uh, Chairman Pollitt, in, um, uh, in your confirmation hearings, you said that, uh, I believe, that no bank is any longer too big to fail. I would point out that the biggest banks are bigger now than in 2008 when they came to us and said they were too big to fail. They would pull the entire economy down. We had to bail them out with $700 billion. And I'd point out that the Wall Street uh, prices in to the value of the bank stock, but more importantly, to the value of their unsecured debt, an implicit federal guarantee, an assumption that they will be bailed out. So I'll have a number of questions for the record, but I will actually ask one for you to, to respond to. We've adopted these profligate fiscal policies, huge tax cuts uh, leading to a massive increase in the deficit number that's right behind you. Uh, then we busted the budget caps. <clears throat> Um, as a, is our monetary policy going to need to be more restrictive this year than it would have been had we not uh, adopted these profligate uh, fiscal and tax policies? Thank you. So, um, of course, when we're setting monetary policy, we're focused on achieving stable prices and maximum employment. And in doing that, we consider many, many factors. Uh, all around the global economy, et cetera. Um, fiscal policy uh, changes can have an effect, and changes of this size can have an effect, and, um, and that can be seen, of course, in the path of policy. It's very hard to say in advance what that would be, but um, the answer to your question is generally we take all those things into account. So the more profligate the fiscal and tax policies, the higher the interest rates you need to set? Yeah, all, of other, all other things being equal. I would just say our, our own um, job is to focus not on fiscal policy, but on monetary policy, and that, so that's our frame of reference. Thank you for evading my question. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Royce, chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Powell. Thank you very much uh, for being with us here today. And uh, I also wanted to thank you for another efforts you undertook, and that was um, in 2011, you spent a considerable amount of time with members of the House trying to walk them through um, the debate that we had on raising the debt ceiling. You were trying to get us focused on all the unintended consequences which would occur if, if we did not raise that debt ceiling, and I very much appreciated the time an effort and facts that you put forward 
So you've got a new voice now at the Fed, and I assume your opinions on the severe consequences of failing to raise the debt ceiling remain. I, I know that um, in August it looks as though the federal government is going to have to borrow or, or have to uh, roll over $500 billion of debt in August. And if we're in a quasi-default situation in August, then clearly it's a real question as who would want to purchase that debt and at what cost would they purchase that debt. And clearly a, a premium on that, uh, a 10 percent premium, it would be a $50 billion hit right there to the, to the uh, interest expense. But there's much more than that that would befall the impact on our markets and, uh, frankly, at corporate debt. And uh, I, maybe I could just give you this opportunity to explain some of the concerns about that issue. Thank you, Mr. Royce. Um, so, of course, we don't, we don't do fiscal policy at the Fed, but I'll accept your invitation and, uh, and just say that it, it is, is very important that um, the federal government and government generally be on a sustainable fiscal path, meaning uh, as, as the baby boomer generation retires, uh, we'll need to address these significant fiscal, fiscal issues that are coming to us over time, over time. Um, and I, I think it's important that Congress do that. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the debt ceiling should, should be something that, that we always raise in a timely fashion. There's no other country in the world has a, has, a, has a separate vote over whether to pay bills that we've already agreed to incur. And um, I think the United States has never defaulted on a, on a principal or interest payment and never should. And I think doing so uh, would be, you know, something I'd really hate to see and could bring very significant consequences. Well, I appreciate your articulating that. You, you've also said that raising the ceiling is only the first step. The job that must be attacked is deficit reduction and addressing the cost associated with, with mandatory spending. And we heard a similar thing from Chairman Greenspan. We heard that from Chairman Bernanke and Chairman Yellen. We're on an unsustainable budget path, and uh, are the remarks that Fed chairmen have traditionally shared with us. As I've raised with previous chairs, I don't think the American public really understands the magnitude of the problem we're facing, and we certainly haven't galvanized the political action necessary to address it. What do you think we, and what do you think you, can do to raise the alarm that the biggest and fastest growing costs in mandatory spending must be addressed? Well, I, I think as um, I, I think I'll follow the path of, of uh, my predecessors and uh, not become a regular commentator on fiscal issues, but rather uh, limit myself to a couple of, of overarching points. The first of Fair which enough. is just that, we, that we, we really need to get on a sustainable fiscal path and that the time to really be doing that is now. Uh, um, so, and, and the second thing I'll say is that when fiscal changes are made, um, it's, it's important that, that uh, to the extent possible, to the extent that enhancing the productive capacity of the economy. We don't, we can't affect productivity other than through keeping prices stable and regulation on a balanced basis. And productivity is the thing that allows incomes to rise, per capita incomes to rise over time. So we don't control the potential long-run growth rate. You have much more authority over that, and I think to the extent fiscal policy can, can focus on ways to increase attachment to the labor force and uh, create incentives for uh, more skills and, and aptitudes among our labor force and, and, uh, and uh, in greater investment in R&D and that kind of thing, that's a healthy thing. Thank you very much, Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Powell, uh, welcome. As you know, the Treasury Department is currently undergoing a review of the uh, CRA, Community Reinvestment Act's regulations, uh, and will be recommending changes to the banking agencies, including the Federal Reserve. So my question to you, Mr. Powell, is uh, do you believe that a financial firm's demonstrated pattern and practice of racial discriminating, discrimination and lending should be considered during a CRA examination? 
Thank you, Mr. Meeks. Um, so I, I'm familiar with that process, and I, I take the uh, point of it to be what, what I am understanding about it is to to uh, inquire into whether CRA policies are in fact providing benefits to their intended beneficiaries, and I think we're we're part of that. We're we're uh, providing our own input into that process. Um, in terms to the answer to your to your your question. Um, I think it is currently the practice that those that that uh, that um, such considerations are considered in CRA exams. It is currently, but I am concerned that some want to defang CRA and take away as part of the process the history as far as discrimination uh, practices and pattern. And so that's why I'm asking you, since the Fed. Uh, since the uh, Treasury will be looking at the new, and I'm a fan, I think we need to update CRA, uh, but I believe that in looking at CRA, you should take into consideration one's practice and panning of racial discrimination, and I'm asking you, sir, what is your position on that? You know, I, I haven't taken a position on that. I, I'm, uh, I, I want to see the, the overall work that comes out of this and uh, evaluate it on that basis. That I may well come to the view that, that you have, but I really haven't, haven't thought carefully enough about it. All right. I just want to remind you, sir, that the CRA was Congress's response to widespread racial discrimination and in the form of redlining. That was one of the primary reasons of the implementation of CRA. If you are even thinking about stripping out practice and patterns of discrimination, you are thereby gutting the reason Congress did CRA in the first place. So it seems to me that that should not even be a part of the dialogue. Uh, in fact, uh, as just given to me by the ranking member, we have uh, an article, Lending Discrimination Redlining Still Plaguing St. Louis, that all the new data shows. Uh, and we can go from city to city across America. So I have real concerns about your answer just now, because to even think about uh, removing that from the CRA, as much as I am an uh, advocate of renewing, because I think that, you know, when you look at where we are now and how banking is done and financial services are rendered, it's completely different than when it was done when we initiated it. But the, 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 the essence of it was to stop redlining and racial discrimination. So let me say that uh, we take a very serious view of any kind of racial discrimination in lending, and we look at it through a variety of our uh, consumer affairs tools and something we take very seriously. Now, I also, and let me ask this, this question, and I will have some further, I would like to follow up with you on, on this matter as, uh, particularly. But um, let me ask you this, when we could talk about these tax cuts, um, how much of corporate tax savings do you think will actually go toward wages as opposed to stock buybacks, uh, capital investments, and mergers? And I say this because I want to just let you know, even before you answer, Morgan Stanley analysis estimated that 43% of corporate tax savings will go to buybacks and dividends, which enriches just the top 1% of those major investors. 19% would go toward mergers and acquisitions. 17% would go toward investments. And only the crumbs, 13% would go to one-time bonuses and scant raises. In fact, there's nine pharmaceutical companies that have already announced over $50 billion in buybacks since the tax law was passed. So how much of these taxes will go into salaries and wages, or how much of it will really help the, the income disparity to increase and grow wider? Um, you know, we, we have particular responsibilities, maximum employment, stable prices. We don't, we don't have estimates of that kind of thing. We, uh, there, there, are, there are many other estimates uh, out there, but honestly, we don't have a Fed estimate for what that number would be. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer. Thank you, Chair Hensling, and thank you, uh, Chair Powell, for being here. Good to see you again. Uh, I want to go back to something that I think was touched on uh, when you began um, your, your testimony this morning. During your confirmation hearing, you spoke about the importance of tailoring regulations to fit the, the specific scope and practices of a financial institution. I think 
Your quote was uh, actually, even as we have worked to implement improvements to the banking system, financial system, we have also sought to tailor regulation and supervision to the size and risk profile of banks, particularly community institutions. Uh, I just want to make sure that your, your view on continuing to tailor uh, regulations to the specific institution uh, has remained the same. You're still committed to doing that? Very much so. It's, it's at the heart of what we're, what we're doing uh, at the moment, which is to focus on smaller institutions and without losing any safety and soundness, try to make sure that uh, our regulation is no more burdensome than it needs to be and, and then work our way up the food chain. Right, because you would agree that we need everyone in the financial services food chain, all the way from the largest uh, banks uh, in the world to the small family uh, community banks on main streets all across this country. Indeed, uh, you know, small businesses create a lot of the jobs and, and uh, small banks uh, have a disproportionate share of, of small business lending, although the bigs lend to the small businesses. But we, um, you know, we really want that, that credit to flow and we don't want regulation to inappropriately uh, create too much burden. Right. Earlier this month, Sec Secretary Mnuchin testified before this committee and he, he expressed his commitment to working with Congress to make changes in statute to the way regulators tailor regulations based on the size and complexity of a financial institution. Would you also support uh, this type of legislative effort where necessary to put uh, these tailored regulations in statute? Uh, yes, we, we would and we have. Uh, so, it, and of course, the, the devil's in the details, but as a general matter, I think we could see uh, some law changes that would enable us to, to better and further tailor regulation to smaller and medium-sized institutions. Uh, I, I want to move on to another topic, uh, but continuing the discussion on the importance of getting our regulations right to benefit, benefit Main Street and rural America. Minnesota 6th Congressional District, uh, which I represent, is home to some of the finest and most productive farmers and manufacturers in the world. Many of these uh, same individuals and businesses who are making such a positive economic impact on my district are inadvertently harmed by the current formulation of the supplemental leverage ratio that fails to recognize the exposure reducing nature of initial client margin. This bank capital rule is increasing clearance costs for farmers and manufacturers, making it more expensive for them to use the cleared derivatives market. I hope that as you and your colleagues at the Fed review the SLR, you come to the same conclusion that a coalition of Republican and Democrat members on this committee have, that we must recognize the exposure-reducing nature of initial client margin in a revised bank capital rule. Will you commit to working with us and our colleagues on the Ag Committee who want their constituents to have access to affordable and competitive cleared derivatives markets? Yes, I will. Uh, we, we, we think we need uh, the leverage ratio as a high and hard backstop to, uh, to risk-based capital. And we think that the current calibration of the enhanced supplemental leverage, leverage ratio is, is not appropriate. We're looking at a recalibration that would address that exact concern. Thank you. I, I want to move on to uh, one other topic before uh, my time runs out. Uh, page one and five uh, of your monetary policy report dated uh, February 23rd refers to uh, the labor market. There's a couple of specific entries. Uh, with respect to uh, numbers of people that are, our unemployment rate is at uh, 4.1, it's, it's uh, essentially full employment, uh, but I believe it's on page five where it references the percentage of, uh, and I'm going to add, able-bodied working-aged adults that are actually in the workforce is about 62 percent. This is still uh, abnormally low. Uh, don't you have any concern uh, about that number? And uh, I, I kn well, why don't I add this? You talk about retirements uh, being part of this, the baby boomers leaving the uh, marketplace, but uh, the labor force. But doesn't this also have something to do with the disincentives created by uh, our welfare system in terms of uh, giving people an opportunity to get back into the job market? Time of the gentleman has expired. A very brief answer from the witness, please. 
we focus on labor force participation all the time. It's a really important thing and, and certainly worthy of a longer discussion, which I'd be delighted to have with you. We'll do that. Time, time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Capuano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Powell, for being here. Welcome. Um, some of my colleagues have talked about how we are where we are. The economy clearly seem to be getting better. We all agree with that. Uh, we will disagree on why and how. I personally think that a lot of the good we are seeing today is a result of the actions we took several years ago to, work to stabilize, secure, and improve the economy and is now working its way through the system. But I'll leave that debate for another day. I also want to associate myself with the comments made by Mr. Meeks. Uh, I would encourage you as well to uh, keep a close eye on the CRA. I also want to take that and now expand it a little bit, just a little bit more. I presume that the Fed would not be interested in an economy that just worked for Wall Street and did not work for Main Street. I assume that the Fed would not be interested in an economy that just worked for Texas and didn't work for New York. Therefore, I presume the Fed has some degree of interest in, in not in perfect equity, but at least some equitable distribution of the benefits of a good economy. Is that a, is that a fair assumption or am I completely off? Well, I would say uh, I think we want prosperity to be high and broadly spread. We don't actually have a lot of tools for distributional tools. Those are much more things that Congress and has. I, and I respect that. I understand you have limited tools for lots of things, but as long, I agree that, that is obviously one of the things. You know, a good economy for three people doesn't help for the 300 and some odd million people that live here. So thank you for that. Are you familiar with a, with a new, a relatively new British law? that uh, has just been enacted and just be, uh, being imposed that requires uh, companies of over 250 employees to report uh, income and wages on the basis of gender. Are you familiar with that at all? No, sir, I'm not. Okay, well, that's, that just came out. And the first company to do that report was Barclays, uh, one of the largest banks in the world. And that report, pursuant to British law, shows that women at Barclays uh, earn 26% less than men and receive bonuses that are 60% lower than men. Now, I know that some of those reasons might have reasons as to who owns which position, but it certainly goes towards the idea of equitable distribution of the benefits of the economy. And are you familiar with a, with a rule that was proposed by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, in 2016 that was supposed to go into effect in March that would have required similar reporting by American companies over 100 employees, not just on the basis of gender, but also on the basis of race and ethnicity? No, sir. Okay, fair enough. Well, the reason you're not familiar with it is because the Trump administration stopped it. It was proposed in 2016, companies were given two years to work their way in, but as of last August, the Trump administration said, no, we don't want to know how you pay women, how you pay people of racial groups or ethnicity groups. We don't, we don't care about that. Now, I personally think that's horrendous, and I would actually say that, again, if you're interested in an economy that has some degree of equitability, you need statistics. You need numbers, uh, anecdotal answers, very interesting, and they make for good political commentary, but they don't help us address the problems. And I would ask, therefore, is something like that, that is new to Britain, Britain, doesn't seem to have impacted Barclays in any particularly bad way, but provides us the information we have to go forward to argue for pay equity across the board. Now, I am a white male, but I'm not interested in my success being at the expense of people who are not white men. And I would ask, is the Fed interested at all? Would you be interested in pursuing something? You oversee 7,000 entities, some of them large, some of them small, most of them pretty large. Would you be interested in pursuing some degree of, not intrusive, but some degree of investigation as to how they pay their employees, if it's equitable or not? I, uh, first, I'm, again, I'm not at all familiar with either the British bill or the EEOC uh, proposed rule that was, uh, I'm not familiar with either of those. And uh, these are the kind of things that Congress should consider. You know, we, ha we have a job, we have a really important job to do that you've assigned us to do. And for now, we're going to stick to that and try to achieve. Well, then I, and I respect that. And I, and I want you to stick to that. But as we talked about earlier, some degree of equitable distribution of the benefits of a good economy is your job. Not perfect equity, not every aspect, but in the one aspect you can control, overseeing 7,000 financial institutions. Don't you think it's a fair thing to ask 
how they pay their women, how they pay their African Americans, how they pay their Hispanics, if it's based on fairness or if it's based on some degree of discrimination? You don't think that's a fair thing for you to ask? I, I don't think it's a question for the Fed. I mean, I think it's a question for other agencies and for, for really— So you think it'll be—boy, that's a great answer. I think we're going to hear more about this. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Pittenger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Powell, for coming before the committee. Congratulations on your confirmation. We look forward to working with you. Chairman Powell, it's my understanding that the Fed has been actively involved in developing a potential alternative to LIBOR called SOFR and a secured overnight funding rate. Uh, has there been a robust cost-benefit analysis conducted by the Fed regarding the potential economic impact to consumers and commercial borrowers relative to shifting from LIBOR to SOFR? Well, I would say, uh, let me say that the, the situation with LIBOR is such that um, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority in London has said that they will no longer compel banks to submit uh, their submissions to, you know, f the LIBOR panel after the end of four years. And at that time, the FCA can no, lo no longer guarantee the continuation of LIBOR. Now, if LIBOR were, LIBOR were to stop being uh, published then, there are 300 plus trillion dollars worth of LIBOR-based contracts in the world, and that has all the potential of being a pretty significant financial stability problem. So solving it is a very high priority for us and I think for financial regulators around the world. There will be costs to doing so, but they would be trivial in comparison to the failure to uh, be ready for this change should it be necessary. What type of borrowing costs do you project uh, uh, for businesses as a result of uh, the impact of this change? So we're, we're actually seeking a lot of input from, uh, from businesses that will be subject to this uh, at the moment. but. Um, but honestly, though, the, the cost of a failure to act would be potentially sure. quite high. Yes, sir. Uh, since repo rates uh, go the opposite direction uh, to LIBOR during market stress, uh, do you anticipate any new systemic risk that arise in the banking sector from uh, shifting to SOFR? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part. Do you expect any systemic risk in, in moving in the banking sector in shifting to SOFR? Yes, I do. I think systemic risk would be decreased by, by moving to SOFR. LIBOR spreads uh, blew out during the crisis, um, and I think, you know, a, a risk-free rate, which is really used to, to price uh, the vast uh, derivative markets and not, not so much the bank lending markets, it's really much more in the derivative space now, would be important to have, would be an improvement from a financial stability perspective to have SOFR over LIBOR. When, when SOFR was selected, uh, through the process of the Alternative Reference Rates Committee in, in 14, uh, were community banks and regional banks a part of that process? Uh, some of the regional banks were. I mean, it's, it's principally affecting the derivatives business, at least in the first entrance, instance. So it was, uh, we had, we had a, a lot of different groups around the table, and, and, and at this point, we're very much broadening that circle to include other financial institutions, including community banks and, and other parts of the financial system. Do you anticipate any potential cost relative uh, to the community banks in this shift? I, I, don't, I don't think it, there shouldn't be meaningful full costs, and we'd sure like to know if there are. If banks do continue to participate in the LIBOR panel, would you encourage a multiple rate approach that was driven by market choice? Yes, or would you support LIBOR for banking lending uh, through for SOFR uh, for uh, derivatives? Yes, sir. We, we've always said that uh, if, if people want to keep using LIBOR, that's fine as long as it's continuing to be published. What we're doing is preparing for the risk that it wouldn't be published, we're, and we're not, you know, saying that that's what will happen. But we need to be ready just in case that does happen. Yes, sir. On another subject, what do you anticipate will be the any changes that you'll bring to the Fed relative to transparency in the Fed? Well, I think uh, you know we're we're committed to being as transparent as we possibly can about monetary policy and about regulation. And I think uh, if I remember what 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 it was like back when I was an undersecretary of the Treasury in the 1990s. Uh, the Fed didn't even publish a post-meeting statement. And now you look at the massive number of things we publish, we're much more transparent. I think we can continue on that path. We're never done with that. 
In regulation, I think it's very important that we be um, that we be transparent. In fact, we're we're working across a broad range of issues there, including I would point out stress testing. We've got a package of transparency regulations, and in general, I, I think it's appropriate for us to always be working on that. And uh, it's just one last quick market. question. I've got 50 percent fewer banks in North Carolina today than we had in 2010. Do you foresee Fed policies that would uh, enhance and assist uh, community banks in particular? Time of the gentleman has expired. A very brief answer from the witness, please. It's a long-running trend, and uh, we don't like to see it, and we don't want to make it any worse. And I'd be happy to continue this with you. Thank you. Again, the time of the gentleman from North Carolina has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, ranking member of our Financial Institutions Subcommittee. Thank you, Chairman Henseling, for holding this hearing, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for your testimony today. Uh, Chairman Powell, do you uh, agree that uh, the um, U.S. housing is in, in a recovery mode as far as um, uh, uh, transactions and, and the housing market in general is, he is healthy? Yes, sir. It's been a gradual recovery, but it's ongoing. Well, along those lines, I want to pick up where uh, Mr. Meeks and Mr. Capuano uh, questioned you. Uh, I've shared with your staff a recent article from my hometown newspaper about uh, black home buyers continuing to be denied conventional mortgage loans at a much higher rate than whites, even when controlling for income, loan amount, and neighborhood. Uh, where, and, and as you, and in the St. Louis metropolitan area, uh, African Americans who apply for conventional mortgages are two and a half times more likely to be denied than non-Hispanic whites, and that's according to two years of recent Humda data. Um, and, and as you know, where there's loan activity, houses have a chance to sell. Where houses sell people move in. Where people move in, restaurants, community centers, and grocery stores are built. And none or very little of that is happening in low to moderate income neighborhoods in St. Louis or elsewhere in this country. So my question is, what can the Federal Reserve do to ensure that applicants for home mortgages are treated equally and the bad actors who steer and redline communities of color are eliminated from this process or change their policies. Can you give me any direction in that area? I'd be glad to, sir. Um, first of all, racial discrimination in mortgage lending and in any kind of lending is completely unacceptable. And wherever we have authority, we will use it to, to stop that from happening and punish it when it does happen. Um, we have some authority here. The CFPB has quite a lot of authority in this area as well, but for where we have it for the banks that we supervise, we supervise carefully and aggressively to, to try to find these problems and address them. And, and as you know, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, a law that's been in, on the books for 50 years, uh, uh, prohibited those practices of steering and redlining. Now, I shared with you this article because I want you to a, a more extensive response from you on what actions we can take against bad actors like U.S. Bank, who is cited in that argue, uh, article, the fifth largest inst financial institution in this com country, who have, have denied mortgages across the board in the community that I represent. And, and that stymies economic activity. It doesn't help it. So I, I would love to collaborate with your office on how we stop these policy and practices that are discriminatory. Um, let me ask you, you wow, um, and, and hopefully you will be willing to work with me on that. Yes, sir. While President Trump recently tried to take credit for December unemployment numbers, showing African American unemployment at its lowest recorded level, this too is part of a long-term trend 
that started under the Obama administration in which African American unemployment has steadily declined for the past seven years. In addition, racial disparities continue to persist with the unemployment rate for whites currently at 3.5 percent, unemployment for African Americans stands at 7.7 percent. Uh, with African American unemployment more than twice as high as white unemployment, um, clearly more progress is needed. Share with us your vision for the Fed attacking persistent unemployment among African Americans. What we can do on that front, sir, is, uh, is we can take seriously our obligation to pursue maximum employment. And we understand fully that while the national unemployment rate is low and while in many regions uh, the unemployment is actually even lower than 4.1 percent, you meet, you meet a lot of uh, congressmen and senators who come from places where, uh, you know, where unemployment is in the twos. I'd like to, to explore it with time. You. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Powell. Uh, thank you for being here. And before I ask a general question and a broader question, I do note that I think you're my fourth chairman to be able to uh, visit with in this environment since I've been a member of this committee. Uh, and I'd like to discuss an issue with you today that you and I have already discussed. And my good colleague, uh, subcommittee chairman, Mr. Luptemeyer, has a bill regarding, and that's the supplemental leverage ratio clearing margin. And I know that uh, Blaine's bill has strong bipartisan support for members of this committee and the Ag Committee. And in essence, it would offset those margin amounts for purposes of SLR because margin is inherently a risk management tool and legally must be kept from a bank's own funds. The Fed can affect this change without legislation, uh, however, and your predecessor showed a willingness to look at the issue, and I was hoping you might be willing to consider that, uh, that situation, that sort of a fix yourself. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're, we're taking a careful look at the enhanced supplemental leverage ratio, and, uh, and uh, I think our view is that the leverage ratio is a very important uh, requirement for banks, but it should be a backstop. It should be a high and hard backstop to risk-based capital. And I think that the enhancement to the supplemental leverage ratio um, that we put into place in, I guess, 2013 in that range um, went a little too far. And it, it unfortunately seems to be deterring some low-risk uh, wholesale-type activities that we really want financial institutions to engage in. And, and one of those is, is um, client clearing and particularly not counting margin. But I think our, our way of addressing that is, is going to be, I think, to to lower the calibration of the enhancement to the supplemental leverage ratio. And that seems that does seem to get done what needs what needs doing there. Well clearly something needs to be addressed. Now let me ask a more broader question. I represent the northwest half of the great state of Oklahoma. It's ag and it's energy and it's Main Street business. So we're a commodity driven economy. And the price of commodities, of course, is a reflection of both supply and demand. And while, uh, while supply is not an issue for the Fed to be concerned about, I, s I represent industries where technology advancement has been used amazingly, uh, uh, very successfully, whether it's precision agriculture and increasing the output of our farms and ranches with fewer inputs, or on the energy side of the equation. 3D seismographing, horizontal drilling, just the most amazing technological advances of the last 10 years, and that's increased supply. But my producers see since 2014 that whether it's oil and gas or wheat and cattle, uh, that literally prices are half what they were in 2014. Let's discuss for just a moment, uh, expand on your comments earlier about where you think the Fed projections would have uh, economic growth and demand uh, in the year or two or three down the road in the United States, because we've got a supply equation. That's our challenge. But uh, if demand picks up, life gets better economically at home. That's, that's typically the case, as you know. Um, so I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't updated my own uh, projections, but I'll just say generally that it, it does feel to me that uh, we're, the next couple of years look quite strong. And you should see strong demand from consumers. You should see in businesses investing. And I would expect the next two years on the current path to be 
you know, to be good years for the economy. And uh, labor markets continuing to improve, inflation moving up to 2 percent. And I would think um, that that should create a good environment for people in your district who are in the commodities businesses as well. The old adage about the uh, rising tide ri raises all ships. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Would the gentleman yield to the chairman? Of course, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the minute and a half that he had um, remaining, um, I had a question, Chairman Powell, um, dealing back on the interest on excess reserves. I'd ask your predecessor this question, and the answer was not clear to me. I think, as you know, under statute, um, that the rate must be, and I'm trying to find the exact language, um, above, uh, cannot be above the usual level of short-term market interest rates. And yet we know that um, the Fed has been paying a price over the Fed funds rate, been paying over LIBOR, and certainly I think is currently paying 150 basis points, yet our constituents typically receive about 10 basis points on their savings account. And so I'm just curious on what does the phrase above the usual level of short-term market interest rates mean? In your 2012 rulemaking that implemented IOER, it allowed you it allowed the rate to get pegged to your primary credit rate, but that's an administered rate, which means you can set it where you want to set it. So legally, is there any cap to the interest rate you can pay in IOER? Could you pay 300 basis points, 400 basis points, 500 basis points? So I, I think as you suggested, uh, we're not uh, permitted under the law to, pull, to pay above the, gen I think it, the language is the general level of short-term interest rates. I, that, that's I, something like that. So I would look at that and I would see commercial paper, I'd see repo, I'd see wholesale deposits, I'd see short-term interest rates, money market funds, things like that, less than a year. And I think where IOER is set is, the whole idea of IOER is to use it as a tool to move those kinds of interest rates around and they tend to be highly But correlated. you're paying 150 basis points, our constituents are getting 10 basis points. So and you can retail deposits, as you know, are, are sticky on the way up and, the, and they're, they generally come up with a lag. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your attendance. Appreciate that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal around, around uh, ETFs, and I, I wanted to get your uh, thoughts on this. Uh, the particular story noted that uh, shares of everything from manufacturers to banks to oil production companies are all rebounding together after tumbling in unison er earlier in the month. Uh, the article noted that one factor contributing to the close correlation among the S&P's various sectors was driven by the growing popularity of exchange-traded funds. And I know that ETFs usually invest in wide swaths of the market. and. Uh, when that's all correlated, it can sometimes uh, increase the volatility. At least that's, that's what the, uh, the data would suggest. And uh, I'm just wondering, does the Fed think that there's uh, risks to the broader financial system associated with complex ETFs? And is the, is the Fed concerned about that? Any, any ideas? So it's an interesting question. I, I saw that article, and of course we looked after the volatility uh, came and then subsided. Where uh, we looked uh, carefully to try to understand really what did happen, and I, it seems that the markets were generally orderly through almost all of that all of that time. Uh, and um, ETFs are a particular form of, of fund, and uh, I don't I don't think they were particularly at the heart of of what went on on those days. Um, uh, but it's something we're talking to our fellow agencies, particularly the SEC, I think, would be, the, would be um, best positioned to look at this. But it, it's, it's a question that we're looking into. Okay, thank you. Um, on a completely different topic, in your remarks you talked about uh, the historically low uh, unemployment rate among people of color, but 
again, you acknowledge that the, the rate of unemployment for people of color is much higher than and for, for white workers. And uh, given the fact that the participation rate, according to your own testimony, has been fairly constant, uh, does the Fed have any suggestions to the Trump administration about if, if the wind is at our backs now, if we're putting more people to work, how do, we, how do we close that gap? How do we get more people of color into the workforce uh, so that, uh, again, we close that gap? As I mentioned, Mr. Lynch, our part of it is to take seriously our obligation to achieve maximum employment, and I think we're doing that. Um, we don't have tools that are that are good at addressing these kind of disparities and those. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you to rec suggest recommendations to 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 the White House. That's they ha they have the power to do it. They have the tools to do it. Right, and I, you know I, I wouldn't want to uh, you know presume to uh, recommend policies that are away from our general mandate. But I'll just say generally that I think that policy. Well, let's just say we're trying to reduce unemployment. That that's certainly part of your. I, I think the, the the constructive thing for in this area is really uh, to focus on, and it's a long-run problem, but to focus on education and training. We want everyone to have opportunity. We want this to be a society where everyone has opportunities to succeed. And part of that is, is reaching people through the educational system, and I, I would point you in that direction. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Holgren. Thank you, Chairman Hanseling. Uh, Chairman Powell, good to see you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for being with us today. On June 22nd, uh, 2017, you testified before the Senate Banking Committee uh, and you said, and I quote, we believe that the leveraged ratio is an important backstop to the risk-based capital framework, but that it is important to get the relative calibrations of the leverage ratio and the risk-based capital requirements right. Doing so is critical to mitigating any perverse incentives and preventing distortions in money markets and other safe asset markets. Changes along these lines also could address concerns of custody banks that their business model is disproportionately affected by the leverage ratio, ratio end quote. I've worked with uh, my colleagues on this committee, especially uh, Keith Rothfuss and Bill Foster on legislation that was passed out of the committee 60 to zero uh, that would provide relief from the supplementary leverage ratio for institutions who are predominantly in the business of providing custody services. Uh, the Treasury Department's June 2017 report recommends changes to the supplementary leverage ratio for cash on deposit with central banks, which is in line with the legislation reported by the committee. I wonder, do you support the Treasury's Department's recommendation, and how will you work with the OCC and FDIC to make those changes? I agree with you, uh, sir, that uh, the leverage ratio um, can deter banks and, and uh, from engaging in low-risk wholesale activities, particularly the custody banks. And so we've looked carefully for some time now at how to provide relief. And our preference for the way to do that is to just recalibrate the enhanced supplemental leverage ratio. And the custody banks would, would feel significant relief because they have the smallest surcharges. So that is our preferred way to do that. Uh, following up on that, uh, as you know, with uh, these considered uh, changes to the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio, uh, they only cover the GSIBs. Uh, do you believe changes to the Basel, Basel leverage ratios are only necessary for the GSIBs, or would you also support changes to the larger supplementary uh, leverage ratio? Um, the, the regular supplementary, supplementary leverage ratio, based on my conversations with, uh, with financial institutions, including the custody banks, is not particularly binding for them, as a, certainly as it relates to the custody banks. So it's really the, the, we chose to make this enhancement, and I think we got the calibration a little bit wrong, and so our, our plan is to roll that back. Okay. Uh, one last uh, thing on this, and I'll move on. But uh, CBO recently provided a cost estimate for the implementation of HR 2121. Uh, as you probably know, this CBO oftentimes relies upon input from the executive branch for such estimates. I wonder if you could commit to sharing uh, this correspondence between the Fed and CBO with my staff and with the committee of determination of uh, costs for implementation of 2121. Would you be willing to work with us on that? I'll be willing to work with you. I, ha I have to look into. Uh 
how we would do that. That's great. Um, and my concern for this uh, is that the banking regulators are only looking uh, for uh, providing relief to the GSIBs. Uh, GSIBs are subject to the enhanced SLR, as you said, while the less large banks are only subject to SLR. Northern Trust uh, is important uh, in Chicago, amazing uh, institution, 120 some years, more than that, uh, that they've been around, uh, but they're not a, a GSIB uh, and thus not subject to the ESLRs. However, they are still subject to binding capital constraints. So it is a concern of mine. Um, moving on, uh, similar to uh, my question regarding adjustment to Basel leverage ratios, I wanna ask you about uh, the tr treatment of centrally cleared options. The Treasury Department's October 2017 report on capital markets notes, and I quote, the current exposure method model, for example, requires options contracts to be sized in their notional face value rather than allowing for a risk adjustment to notional uh, to reflect the actual exposure associated with these derivatives. Specifically, CME does not permit uh, delta adjustment for the notional value measurements of options, end quote. It also notes, and I quote, the CME may be uh, responsible for a corresponding reduction in the bank's ability and willingness to facilitate access for their market makers' clients who are the primary liquidity providers in these markets, end quote. I understand this concern was realized by some market makers during some of the volatility incurred by markets in recent months. wonder if uh, you agree with the Treasury report's recommendation. Specifically, do you believe there should be a risk-adjusted approach for valuing options for purpose of the capital rules to better reflect the exposure, such as potentially weighting options by their delta? So I, I actually believe there is a, an alternative, um, more risk-sensitive uh, approach that we're moving to on the, in that area. But let, I want to check back with our experts, and I'll, I'll follow up with you. That'd be great if you can let us know that. Uh, my, my time is up. But thank you again. I appreciate your willingness to work with us. And I yield back to the chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Rec uh, welcome, Chairman Powell. Uh, I, you know, what's disturbing me and what's remarkable, um, and I think downright disturbing to me are the policies coming out of this uh, Trump administration in three specific areas that you as the chairman of the Fed, uh, our chief economic balancing officer, shall we say, has a direct input on. Um, and did you know, for example, and there are three areas particularly. First, the tax cuts of the president. Are you aware that 83 percent of the president's tax cuts go to benefit just 1 percent of the American families? That's not fair at all. Uh, if we go to his budget cuts, you know who is impacted the most because of his budget cuts? It's the African-American community. And let me go to his draconian, terrible proposals to cut $17.2 billion away from food stamp recipients. And then if that's not mean and ugly enough, they want to turn out and now stop food stamp recipients from even being able to go into the grocery stores and buy groceries, just like you and I. This is mean, man. And I, I, I want you, you seem like a very reasonable person. Tax cuts going to 1 percent, the wealthiest people, and then on the same token, they want to send food. We can do without a lot of things, but not food. They want to send food in boxes, canned food, dried milk, powder milk, to the poor people in this country. Now, Mr. Chairman, you got the dual mission of inflation, unemployment. On top of that, they are crushing the most primary group that's being crushed are African Americans and people of color. And I'm here to tell you, we are going to stand up and fight this administration. Mm -hmm. 
And I want to ask you to get on our side, the side of the American people, because it is clear to me that this President Trump is not on the side of the American people. You tell me getting 83 percent of the benefits of the tax cuts to the 1 percent of the wealthiest and then turn around cutting $17.2 billion out of the thing we need the most, food for the poorest people. And then on top of that, shipping their food <laughs> in boxes to sit on their porch, dried milk for their babies. You tell me, Mr. Chairman, is this the way you think about America? Um, thank you, sir. Um, I, I can only say these are these are very important issues, and I take it to heart. But uh, it, these are not issues that we have uh, have authority over. Or no, I was waiting on you to say that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> There's nobody better suited. You are the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Do you know when you sneeze, Wall Street crumbles? That's why I'm pointing this to you, Mr. Powell. I've looked at your background. You're, you are well prepared for this. Your experience, as I've read it, shows that you have a deep compassion for people. All I'm asking you to do is to every once in a while, if you could say, hold on, Mr. President, this, this isn't right to be shipping the food to the poorest people in this country and denying them a right to go in the grocery store just like me and you buy food. It's not. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and welcome, Chairman. Good to have you here. Uh, the Fed supervises several insurance companies that own thrifts. And an insurance company that has been designated as a, as a, as a non-bank SIFI, Congress has taken a strong interest in ensuring that Fed supervision reflects the business of insurance and the primacy of state regulation of insurance. Most notably, Congress passed legislation in 2014 to ensure that capital rules for insurance companies are tailored to the business of insurance. We appreciate all your work on this rule. Separate from the pending capital rule, I believe there could be, there, that more could be done to ensure that on-the-ground supervision of insurance companies is proportional to the risk these companies pose in terms of safety and soundness and also reflect the existing system of state supervision. What are you doing to ensure this and what more could the Federal Reserve do here? Thank you, sir. Thanks for your comments. Uh, so, um, we do, I think from the beginning, we've, as I, I think you see, we've, we've tried hard to, to look at insurance as a new area for us where we needed to develop expertise and where it's different from banking and it needs to reflect the risks of the insurance business. And so we've really invested in that and we've, we've been tried to be open with it. Continue to do that uh, in, in developing our capital requirement. We've, we've tried to reflect that. And I think uh, we were very open to uh, the views of uh, experienced insurance regulators, some of whom we've, we've hired and also people from the industry. Um, by my count, there are four vacancies on the Board of Governors. How do these vacancies impact the ability of the Fed to fulfill its mission? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned that. You know, we, we could really use uh, some, more, some more faces on the hall. We've, I don't think we've been down to three governors, uh, certainly not for an extended period before, so I'm eager to, uh, to have more colleagues. Um, as you may know, I, ha I wore an awful lot of hats uh, before I took over my current role. And so I've handed those hats out to my two colleagues. And so we're, we're all three quite eager to have, uh, to have more people on board. Um, we don't necessarily need all seven immediately, but we'd sure love to get there. You know, we've talked a little bit about diversity of backgrounds. I'd like to talk a little bit about a, a, a diversity of experiences. Um, Professor Charles uh, Calamiris of Columbia University has highlighted the importance of bringing individuals with a diversity of experiences to the table when discussing monetary and regulatory policy. He describes the culture of the Federal Reserve System as academic dominated. While academics surely need to have an important voice in these highly technical debates, I can also see how, non, how a non-academic practitioner perspective 
can be helpful. Uh, can diversity of experiences like yours help support a more reliable monetary and regulatory policy? I strongly believe that, let me say. Uh, you know, I think we need great economists around the table, we need, and we need lots of them, but we also need people from other backgrounds, people of experience in business and from, you know, managing profit and nonprofit institutions and from, um, you know, the financial markets. And I think, uh, and from the law, we, those people bring diverse perspectives and they make our decisions, I think, better and our discussions, you know, better. Uh, as you may know, our national debt exceeds uh, $20 trillion and continues to grow rapidly. At the same time, the Fed has been engaged in an unprecedented monetary policy experiment. Some have argued that in carrying out this experiment, the Fed has stepped beyond what is necessary for the conduct of monetary policy and ventured into credit policy. Do you worry that unsustainable public debts and the Fed's engagement in credit policy, credit policy may increase political pressures on the Fed? Well, I... Uh it, it's, a, it's a risk. It's not a near-term risk, I would say. And I, it, let's, let's, uh, I, I just would mention, of course, that we are now in the process of normalizing our balance sheet and shrinking it. And uh, so uh, we're moving back to a more normal level balance sheet, and I think we'll be there in, you know, three, four, five years. You know, one thing that's always kind of puzzled me is this target 2 percent inflation rate. You know, just as a layman and looking at this, and the suggestion seems like, I mean, that's benign. But, you know, over 20 years, you mentioned about 20 years. Uh, um, I mean, if you have 100 bucks 20 years ago and you had 2% every year, I mean, the purchasing power for that 100 bucks went down. Can you kind of educate us a little bit <laughs> from your perspective about this 2% target? Sure. Because my count, what, $100 20 years ago at 2%, it, it might cost about 150 bucks today. Uh, so this was this was a big debate, uh, which um, was settled around two percent as opposed to zero um, for central banks to aim at, and it's now the, become a global standard all around the world. Central banks are aiming at two percent, and the, the reason why that was picked over two, in essence, is that it gives us a little more room to cut real interest rates. If the if the interest rate if the if in, if inflation is zero, then interest rates would be you know in the sort of one two three range, and then when it, when a, when a recession comes, we would have very little to cut. So having 2 percent inflation kind of, we think, oils the wheels of the economy and gives central banks uh, a little more ammunition. And it, it has now become the global standard, so it would be hard for any bank to diverge from it. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, the ranking member of our Oversight Investigation Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member. Also, I'd like to thank the persons who are here who call themselves full employment defenders. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what do you consider full employment? I have the number 5.5 percent, but if you differ, I'd like to hear your number, please. You know, I, I would, so I, if I had to make an estimate, I'd say it's um, somewhere in the low fours, but I would stress that it could be, that, what that really means, it could be five and it could be three and a half. Let's take the low fours or three and a half. When is the last time that African-American unemployment was in the low fours or three and a half? I don't think it ever has been in the years we've been measuring it. Uh, quite frankly speaking, it hasn't been since slavery. Uh, that's the last time there was full employment for black people. Mr. Chairman, 6.8 percent seems to be the lowest number that I can find since we've been keeping numbers. And for the last 47 of the last 54 years, it's always been twice that of white unemployment. Twice. Do you agree? Do I agree? Yes, sir. I, Do you agree that that's black unemployment is generally speaking twice that of white unemployment? I, I think that's what the numbers would, would support, Mr. Yes. Chairman, do you agree? I, I agree, yes. It's, okay, it's thank a true you. statement. All right, thank you. It's a true statement. Mr. Chairman, do you also agree that invidious discrimination still exists in the United States of America? I would. Do you agree that when we've had an opportunity to test banks, we have found that invidious discrimination exists in lending? Yes. Do you agree that testing is an effective means by which we can acquire empirical evidence necessary to show that discrimination exists? I do believe it is used in that way, yes. Then, Mr. Chairman, would you support legislation? 
to help us acquire the empirical evidence to show that this exists so that we can do something about it. You see, we now know the facts. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Your charge is the promotion of full employment. I take that to mean full employment, not just for white people. I take that to mean for everyone. And at some point, black unemployment has to be addressed because it is chronically twice that of white people. And we have to use terms like black people and white people to make the point. And we also have to ask that our friends on the other side join black people in doing something about this. Mr. Chairman, that which we will tolerate, we will not change. We have learned to tolerate African-American unemployment being twice that of white unemployment. I refuse to tolerate it. That's why I use language that is clear and concise. There is no question about what I say. The question is, what are we going to do about it? We know that discrimination exists in banking in terms of lending. We know that it exists in other areas of the economy as it relates to African-Americans. The question is, what will we do about it? And by the way, I'm not assigning all of the responsibility to you. That's why I mentioned my friends on the other side and my friends on this side. I'm a liberated Democrat. Democrats and Republicans have to do more about black unemployment. And unfortunately, when a black person challenges the system such as I do, it becomes playing the race card. So let me say today that I'm playing the race card because we have for too long allowed this condition to exist. So Mr. Chairman, I'm going to send you a letter and in the letter I will request that you explain the role that covert and overt unemployment plays in this issue of black unemployment being twice that of whites. I will ask you to identify the primary factors that limit African Americans' access to employment opportunities in sectors that are protected from cyclical downturns in the economy. And I'm going to ask you, if allowed, would testing provide beneficial empirical data? You've already said that you think it would. I'll ask you to put that in writing, Mr. Chairman. I respect you, and I ask that you be of service to all Americans not just white Americans. I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, appreciate you taking the time to be able to be here. One of the big challenges I think we've really faced as a country is uh, the policies in the previous administration had yielded a lethargic growth uh, that had impacted communities across the country. And uh, we're now seeing policies starting to step into place that are actually getting the economy moving, creating job opportunities, putting resources back into the pockets of the individuals who actually earn it, and uh, creating that opportunity uh, for people to be able to increase their prospects uh, for their families, uh, for their communities as well, uh, which I applaud, but want to make sure that they are applied across the board in the country as well uh, to each community. And I'd like to be able to highlight uh, one of the benefits that I've seen in my district uh, from the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in Colorado, uh, the Bank of Colorado, uh, which has a significant presence in the western slope of Colorado, the Four Corners region that I represent, wrote me after passage of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that they anticipate the passage of the reform is going to be having a positive effect on the growth of their businesses and our local economy. In fact, uh, the Bank of Colorado added a special bonus at the end of the year for all 641 of their associates in Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, they're going to be receiving $1,000 in terms of a bonus, and part-time associates are going to be receiving $250 to $500. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in my part of the country, uh, that's real money. It's not a crumb. Uh, it's how we pay a mortgage. It's how we pay for the electric bill. It's how we provide literally for our children. Uh, to be able to boost those opportunities for those employees, uh, it's actually helping Main Street right now. The Bank of Colorado's actions, I think, uh, provide an example for us in terms of uh, new possibilities that exist in the current economy and also looking forward. 
I guess what I'd like to be able to speak to you on is uh, in my state of Colorado, we, we've, and I've often spoke to it, is a tale of two economies. Uh, urban Colorado has been doing well. Uh, their unemployment is down. However, when we move into rural Colorado, we're just now, just now, starting to see the signs of the recovery and those opportunities uh, for the people who live in those rural areas. One of the real challenges that I've heard in our communities has been from our small community banks in terms of the trickle-down effect of overregulation that came out of Dodd-Frank. Uh, the best practices uh, that are being employed uh, that may not have been on paper uh, but are implied and they're feeling those real impacts. And so I uh, know Mr. Laudermilk had brought up with you earlier in the questioning uh, in regards to being able to tailor some of that, uh, the rules and regulations to be able to meet the size, the risk portfolio of the institution. Can you give us an idea of what you see as that real tailoring uh, and when we could expect that to maybe start to take place to be able to open up those doors of economic opportunity for rural America? Um, so in the regulatory space for, for smaller institutions, first of all, we're, we're mindful that the number of banks in, in small banks in rural and, and uh, non-urban areas has declined very sharply over the years, and we don't see that as a good trend, and, and uh, we don't want to be any part of making it worse. There are bigger forces at work there as people move to the cities and that kind of thing. But as it relates to our, our regulation, I think we've, you know, just recently here, uh, we've, we've um, dramatically reduced the, the scope and burden of the call report. We've made exam frequency longer, so you, you have a, longer gaps between, uh, um, between exams. I think we, we tried hard to find ways to simplify the capital requirements because you just don't need the, you know, the kind of, you don't have the, the, the resources to be managing these highly complex capital requirements. So we went through and in a number of areas we simplified. We tried to address the, um, you know, the, the shortage of appraisers in many rural areas. But, you know, honestly, you could go on forever. I think it's, it's a lot of small things. And um, I will just tell you that we're committed to, to doing more, and I hope you'll hold us accountable for that. Well, and I, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I have a piece of uh, legislation, the Taylor Act, uh, to be able to make sure that we've got rules and regulations that are going to be written to be able to meet the size risk portfolio of the institution. And I uh, appreciate your commitment to, uh, and hopefully willingness to be able to work with us, uh, because the objective is, is to be able to open up those doors of economic opportunity for uh, all of our communities uh, across the country. And one issue which has been brought up to me is uh, also in regards to the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, and if you would be willing to work with us on that as well, uh, our banks do want to be able to make those uh, real contributions back in, but uh, we've got some outdated rules that I think we do need to address. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, ranking member of the Monetary Policy and Trade Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for appearing. Just um, want to appreciate the fact that uh, in your written and your oral statement, uh, you have doubled down on your commitment to tend to your dual mandate to look at unemployment as well as monetary policy. And, and I just want to thank you for, appreciate you for that. Um, and, and given that, I guess I just want to focus a little bit on some of the things that I think previously Mr. Green just talked about and also uh, my good friend, colleague, Mr. Barr, talked about uh, in terms of trying to figure out where the Fed, uh, how the Fed is going to balance things. Uh, when we look at unemployment um, um, f for the general public, um, I guess I am, I'm wondering if, um, if, if, if we continue to have 2% uh, uh, as our inflation rate, uh, is that in fact sort of discouraging uh, toward getting some of those groups like African Americans um, mobilized and moved toward more full employment? Uh, do you take any guidance from some suggestions that perhaps the target, inflation target, ought to maybe be maybe two and a half percent? You know, I, I think we're pretty committed to our, we're strongly committed to our 2% uh, inflation goal. Over, over time, um, the level of employment in the economy is, is not a function of, of uh, you, you can't increase it by increasing the inflation rate. 
So uh, we're committed to having a symmetric 2% goal so that we'd be equally concerned with undershoots of that uh, persistent undershoots of 2% and persistent overshoots. Okay. Well, uh, you know, given that, um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the increased uh, income inequality uh, we see in this country. According to the United Nations uh, Rapporteur Report, the United States is on track for being the most unequal, having the most inequality uh, in the world. And given the recent tax bill, where we see, despite what Mr. Barr has indicated about all the bonuses and wage increases, that about 43% of these monies are being spent in buybacks, another 19% mergers and acquisitions, that's like 62%, those two together, only 17% in capital investment improvements, and then the 13% that are in bonuses and raises. We know bonuses are one-time only um, uh, events, uh, which y pale in comparison to the economic benefit that the company gets. So what, what, is, uh, what concerns does the Fed have about the increased, uh, increase in, in income inequality? Um, you know, it's a, it's a big, very complicated set of issues, and I'll just point to a couple of things. The, the first is that um, we've seen a stagnation of middle class median incomes, and that seems to be closely tied to the the flattening out of educational attainment and skills attainment by our workers. And I think we, we need to have the, the best trained workforce and the most highly educated workforce. That'll translate into pro productivity. That'll translate into higher wages. So I think that should be an important focus for us. Okay. Before my time expires, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your patience, um, I am wondering if you think as the chair that we're going to have this tremendous um, GDP growth. Uh, as you might know, the CBO and the JCT uh, put additional GDP growth of the tax bill like under 1%, uh, despite the $1.5 trillion tax cuts, uh, which will increase the deficits about, about that amount over 10 years. Are you, do you agree with the CBO and JCT that this GDP growth um, is, is, is going to, to be under 1%? Um, you know, the, 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 the tax bill was passed about a week and a half after our December meeting, and then the spending bill was about a, a week and a half after our, our January meeting. So in each case, we didn't really have the full, uh, full set of information. I think our view, my, my personal view would be that there will be a, a meaningful in increment to demand, at least for the next couple of years, from the combination of those two things. There will be increased demand. Yes. Uh, uh, although wages uh, aren't necessarily going to keep keep up with that, given given the way these monies are being spent. I'd expect wages to increase this year too, as as I mentioned. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Powell. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, sound monetary policy is critically important to unleashing the economic opportunity of this great nation and her citizens. In 2018, I can tell you, I'm a small business owner for 47 years on Main Street. We are off to a great start. Uh, with a booming economy, low unemployment, and Americans having more money in their pocket due to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Though I'm encouraged by the strides we've made in the last year, I do acknowledge that there's still some much uh, work to do. I look forward to working with you uh, to ensure that our economy is fully empowered and never unnecessarily restricted. So uh, question, Federal Reserve Bank presidents uh, serve a critical role in providing local information to the FOMC. This bottom-up flow of information is one of the Federal Reserve System's most productive features. However, the voting rotation exposes an inconsistency in that some of the largest district economies uh, cast a vote every three years, while smaller economies are requested or represented annually or every other year. So, Chairman, uh, is it your opinion that each region is properly represented under the current voting structure? Let, let me begin by saying that I'm a very strong supporter of our federated system, and, and I think that the, what the Reserve Bank system does, among other things, is it guarantees that we'll have a diversity of perspectives around the table. You've got 12 Reserve Banks, you've got 12 economic staffs, and you know, it, it, I think you make mistakes when everybody agrees, generally, has been my experience, when you have diverse perspectives and people disagreeing. So in terms of the, the structure, 
I, I really don't think it's broken. And I'll just say, when we have an FOMC meeting, you look around the table, all 12 Reserve Bank presidents are there, and, and they all speak. And honestly, I have to go find a list to remember who the voters are and who aren't the voters. So it's, it's really not so much about who has the vote, it's, it's who has persuasive things to say. And I, I really do think it, it, the current equilibrium has served us well, and I, I wouldn't see a reason to change it. Okay. Um, I believe that monetary policy would be better informed if district, repres if, if district representative voted consistently. And <clears throat> San Francisco, Atlanta, Richmond, and Dallas vote every three years, uh, while uh, New York votes every year, and Chicago and Cleveland every other year. Uh, I fear that this underrepresents certain economies and that the needs of regions that vote more frequently uh, could be unjustly prioritized. The presence of Federal Reserve Bank presence on the FOMC helps to drive power away from Washington and New York and empower every economic constituency across the country. So for that reason, I have introduced H.R. 4759, the FOMC Representation Improvement Act, that would provide every Federal Reserve Bank president consistent voting rights, just as New York currently enjoys. So, Chairman, do you support uh, a policy that would allow all districts consistent voting rights? And be as detailed as you want to be. <laughs> you know, I, again, I would just say I really think the current system has served us well, and I, and I think you have a great Reserve Bank president in Texas, and, you know, his Good voice man. is certainly well heard, as it Good should man. be. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you yield to the chairman. Yield to um, the chairman. Yield my time. Uh, as following up on the gentleman from Texas, though, Mr. Chairman, again, as we re rely more on the IOER and less on the FOMC to determine the Fed funds rate, then haven't we diminished the role of these regional Fed presidents? I, I, I know that the uh, FOMC is similar to the Board of Governors, but it's the Board of Governors that set IOER, correct? As a legal matter, yes, but it, it's always set consistent with the broader decision okay. of the FOMC. We I, I would just say, Mr. On that. Mr. Chairman, perhaps that's one more reason we should attempt to uh, normalize monetary policy to ensure that this diversity of view is represented at the table. Um, speaking of a diversity of view, last year in a speech, New York Fed Reserve Bank President William Dudley commented on the Volcker Rule and said, quote, the line between market making and proprietary trading is not always clear cut, which makes regulation in this space difficult. May be worth considering giving greater discretion to trading desks that facilitate client business to intervene when markets are illiquid and volatile. We know we have seen historic volatility and illiquidity in our fixed income market since the advent of the Volcker rule. Do you agree or disagree with President Dudley's analysis? Well, I, I would agree. My, my view is that we can, and we're taking a, a fresh look at the Volcker rule to try to implement it in a way that's faithful to the spirit and letter of the we've, law, but do it in a way that's much We've had a lot of testimony in this committee about how this does inhibit uh, job creation and economic growth in the Financial Choice Act. We repeal the Volcker Act, uh, the Volcker rule. In alternative, we have legislation to make at least the Fed the lead regulator, so there'd be one centralized regulator and exempt community banks. Would the Fed be uh, ready to take on that role should this be signed into law? We would. I mean, I, I think we would, we would probably take it on even without law. I think we're the natural uh, group to, to, take, to have the pen there, and it's a, it's a multi-agency rule, and someone needs to coordinate it, and, and uh, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. The time of the gentleman from Texas has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Kewen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for being here and for your testimony. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, as you know, I represent Nevada, which had the highest unemployment rate in the country uh, during the recession. Um, so despite the progress in reducing the overall level of unemployment uh, since the recession, uh, wage growth has largely remained low and stagnant for the vast majority of Americans. Uh, in fact, the average American hasn't seen a real pay increase since the early 1990s. And many working people have not seen one since the 1970s. According to the Economic Policy Institute, middle-aged workers hourly wage is up only 6% since 1979. Low wage workers' wages have decreased by 5%, while those with very high wages have seen an increase of 41%. Uh, 
So basically picking back on what Ms. Beatty was saying, you know, we live right now in a country where the rich are getting richer at the expense of middle class people. Uh, and I say this, you know, from somebody who has been unemployed before, uh, who has woken up, gotten dressed up, and having nowhere to go, but just knowing that if you keep your head up, you're gonna find something and everything will be okay. But most of the people who are receiving the tax breaks today don't understand that struggle that most Americans have gone through. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, what steps can the Fed or Congress take uh, to help combat this wage inequality, uh, to piggyback on what, what Ms. Beatty was saying, uh, and ensure that further wage gains are shared by middle wage and lower wage workers? I think our part of this, sir, is to take seriously our obligation to achieve maximum employment. And uh, that's what we're doing. And um, I, I would say more broadly on wages, over, over long periods of time, the only sustainable way for wages to go up is for productivity to increase. Productivity is a function of investment in people's skills and investment in plant and equipment by businesses and by people. And so those are, those are things I think that uh, uh, Congress should, we, we don't have those tools, those aren't things we control, but those are things that Congress and the administration, I believe, would be well served to focus on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And do you think that uh, the minimum wage requirements uh, offset the failure of the private market to afford workers a uh, livable wage? Uh, we've seen this discussion uh, in, the, you know, in the last couple of years whether we should be raising the minimum wage uh, you know, nationally. Uh, you know, people have been talking about $12 an hour. People have been talking about $15 an hour. Um, do you think that this is uh, something that needs to happen here in America? You know, minimum wage policy is really a form of fiscal policy. It's really, really not for us. And, and there, there is there's research that shows, uh, you know, for example, that um, that people who provide less value than the minimum wage, entry level workers and that kind of thing can be disadvantaged. And there's research that shows that they aren't. So but I, I think these are these are questions that are really best left left for you. Well, Mr. Chairman, you are the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and I know you're an expert. You probably know more about this than I do. Uh, but I believe that, you know, when you increase the wages on working-class families, uh, they spend more money, they go out there and stimulate the economy, businesses make more money, they hire more people, they expand, they open up a second and a third store, and so on and so on. Uh, whereas, you know, I know some of my colleagues believe that somehow you give these big tax breaks to the millionaires and the billionaires, and somehow it's going to trickle down to the workers. Uh, I don't believe in that. I represent part of Las Vegas, where a lot of the folks are hardworking people, uh, janitors, housekeepers, uh, cooks, chefs, waiters. Uh, those folks are the people who make Las Vegas run. If you increase the wages to those folks, they're going to go out there and spend more money and stimulate the economy. And that is the reason why I believe uh, we've had this uh, wages you know, uh, inequality in this country. Uh, but with that being said, Mr. Chairman, my last question is, uh, why has the Fed been so focused on preempting inflation since the 1980s uh, when wages have been barely budged? Well, I, I think it serves all constituencies well, including, by the way, the, the people in the lower income uh, groups to have, low in, have inflation low and under control. I mean, it, it really hits those groups the hardest when inflation gets out of control. And so I think it's a good thing for the economy that we've managed to control inflation. I think uh, the, the way we get at wages, again, is by taking maximum employment seriously. And I think, you know, at the moment, we've really, really done that. And for some years, we've really done that. So um, it will Thank show up in wages. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, the majority whip of the committee. Thank the chairman. I thank Chairman Powell for his testimony today and in listening to the discussion this morning. I think we need to be clear on the record, uh, both chairman, chairman of the committee and chairman of the Fed, that the biggest thief for working people in this uh, country and across the world is inflation. Nothing depresses uh, buying power more than inflation, and nothing cuts into those uh, at the uh, hardest working part of our society than inflation. So I think minimizing inflation and having uh, dollar stability and safe and sound capital markets are a worthy objective of of the Fed. And so uh, thank you and your colleagues for fighting for uh, modest inflation so that 
people have real wage increases. And I do believe that one of the benefits of the restructuring of our tax system will be to increase productivity, and productivity will see wages go up, and we've certainly seen that here in the first uh, uh, two months of the year as company after company has talked about that. Uh, Mrs. Moore referenced it as well, but I saw a Morgan Stanley research study this week that calls for earning projections for 2018 to be up 8 percent, and that over 44 percent of those companies fully expect to reinvest in their companies in training and capital expenditures and both these efforts will uh, produce higher wages. Uh, and another 30 percent of companies plan to increase CapEx to increase productivity as well as uh, distribute more earnings. So I view these things as positive for our economy. <clears throat> uh, I want to follow up on Chairman Hensherling's comments a bit, uh, Chairman Powell, about uh, your exchange you had on the Volcker rule. Uh, uh, the chairman talked about uh, a bill I've introduced to harmonize regulatory oversight because you've, co you've noted in previous testimony, uh, uh, President Dudley has, uh, even Mr. Trillo has, about the complexity of this rule that we're not getting it done, we're not doing a good job of even enforcing the rule. But on this harmonization bill, I've had some difficulty in getting members to understand that giving relief to banks under $10 billion, community banks, which is what is in Senator Crapo's bill over in the Senate, is somehow letting those bill, those, uh, those community institutions sort of off the hook of safe and sound uh, banking practices. And I'd like for you to uh, respond to what I've told them. By saying our community banks are, are not subject to the Volcker rule, that doesn't mean that they're not subject to the careful scrutiny of our bank regulators for safe and sound banking practices. And isn't it true that if one of your regulators went in a bank under $10 billion, a holding company, and they were doing something that you deemed unsafe and unsound related to Volcker-type activities, that they could be disciplined for that under the existing banking rules? Yes, sir. It is absolutely true that, that uh, we don't need Volcker to go in and find uh, unsafe and unsound practices. In, in addition, certainly in, in the, the bill you mentioned that Senator Crapo has introduced, you also have to — you can't have any, anything more than a very small trading book in the first place, right. even if you are under $10 billion. So right. we don't see significant safety and soundness or implications at all from that. I appreciate that. I, I just think it, we need to be clear in this committee that we have the tools necessary to enforce safe and sound banking practices for banks of all sizes, particularly those in the, in the smaller size that's referenced in, in my legislation, but that the real mission here by uh, designating the Fed as the principal regulator among your colleagues that will get better, more discreet interpretive guidance on how to properly enforce the Volcker Rule, which I think is a big source of confusion around the capital market system. Do you agree with that? I do. It has been difficult with these multi-agency groups to get to agreement, and I just the Volcker rule in particular, I think, uh, is quite complex, and we can certainly simplify it. Uh, you, I think, uh, when you testified previously, said that some trading desk needed a Ouija board to uh, figure out uh, uh, what the decision to make, and that freezes up capital markets in times of illiquidity that I'm the most concerned about is misinterpreting that rule by compliance departments. I think Have you we, seen that in your work with your district bank presidents about that exact thing where we're hurting illiquid securities? So we, we do hear that. We, um, we do. I mean, I think if you, it stands to reason if you provide more certainty about where the, where the law applies and where it doesn't, and you don't have to convene a giant meeting and break out the Ouija board to find out whether you're complying with the law or not, then you're going to have more certainty and you're going to have uh, people being able to do their business better. Well, I appreciate you and I wish you my very best wishes for your service as our Chairman of the Federal Reserve. Time of the gentleman has expired. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Chairman. No, Mr. Chairman, um, the Cato Institute estimates that ending the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program and making those young people deportable could cost the U.S. economy over $280 billion in reduced economic growth over 10 years. The Center for American Progress puts that number at about $460 billion, bigger, but still a loss. The U.S. Chambers of Commerce does not put a number on it, but they do say 
and I'll quote, uh, ending DACA would be a nightmare for Americans, America's economy. So what kind of economic impact would ending DACA and making 700,000 Dreamers deportable have on our economy? Well, <clears throat> let me say that uh, these are difficult and important issues, and uh, we, of course, don't do immigration policy at the Fed. But I'm not asking you about immigration policy. I'm asking about economic impact of taking uh, 700,000 people, 90 percent of whom are employed, out of the economy suddenly. That's what I'm asking you about. And I, and I, I don't want to wade into a very uh, hot political discussion, but I will, I will say this. Um, so if you think about uh, economic growth, it can really come from, from only in two ways. You can simplify it. It's either going to be more people working or it's going to be higher productivity. We've talked a lot about productivity, but the workforce is now growing at only about 0.5 percent per year, and you know some of that has been from immigration. So to the extent you, you care about potential growth, you need, to be, you need to be considering that in your discussions about immigration. So what I hear you saying is that taking 700,000 people, on 90 percent of whom are employed out of the workforce, would be, would, could cause problems. I'm just not going to comment on that particular situation. That's yeah, I hear you, but I mean, but I'm asking about the economics of it. I'm asking you as uh, somebody who leads an institution that has a mandate not just to keep inflation down, but to pursue uh, full employment. You have a dual mandate, and I'm asking you about employment, and you're declining to answer my question. Would you like to just talk about what it mean, what, what, what it would mean to take 700,000 people out of the economy? Let's just say they all went to Mars for some reason. In fairness, Congressman, I, I'm, I, I really am not going to get into the debate over DACA. I'm just not going to do that. I'm not asking you to, sir. I'm just asking you to talk about the economics of it. Well, and I, well let me ask I, you this. I said the, I, let I, me see if you could answer this. <clears throat> what, what does it mean to have a group of people in their prime working years suddenly disappear from the economy? Well, all else held equal, you, you know, you would lose some productivity from that, some output from that. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, there's a, a research group known as Reveal. They did a study uh, looking at literally millions of uh, Hamda reports. Um, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to have their uh, report uh, submitted for the record. Without objection. Yeah, but it, it, they looked at 31 million Hamda records in a year-long analysis and found that 61 municipal areas across the United States had uh, unfairly um, had denied uh, uh, people of color, black and brown people, the right to uh, take on a mortgage uh, compared to equally qualified whites. Um, what is the economic impact of that discrimination in your view? I mean, when people are, when people can afford a mortgage and are told you can't have one, <clears throat> I mean, what, what sort of impacts can we expect to see when that happens on a systematic basis? You know, I think it's so fundamental to our society that, uh, that there should not be racial discrimination along the lines of credit availability. But see, that's a, that's a moral position, and I agree with you. But I want to know, how does it affect the economy? Well, uh, it, it start with those people. I mean, I think if people are denied access to credit, that, then they're going to be less able to attend school, perhaps less able to start a family, less able to, uh, you know, move to a new job, all kinds of things. Economic outcomes for individuals would be potentially significantly reduced. And I think if you, if you take that out across a broad population, it, it would certainly hurt the growth of the country. Well, I, want to, I, w I do want to get your views on whether you agree with Fed Chairman uh, Neil Kashkari that uh, increasing legal immigration would grow our economy, but I'll uh, probably have to get that answer another time. Time of the gentleman back, has Chairman. expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chairman Powell, again, congratulations. I know you've heard it many times today, but we're glad to have you here. Uh, so would it be fair to say that the current administration is willing to review and perhaps even question uh, decisions made by the uh, FSB, the Financial Stability Board, in the past? 
Love to have some of your thoughts on that, about looking back at decisions that they've made. Would you be willing to review and question those? Uh, um, sure. I mean, we, we, I think we always, the FSB doesn't make uh, decisions about U.S. regulation. They make recommendations, and then we were, if we were to enact something in a law, we'd, in a, in a regulation, sorry, you know, we would put that out for comment, and, and you know, anything like that could be, could be reconsidered in principle, sure. Sure. So as much as there, that comes to mind, but maybe you'll help me. Certainly. So as much as, I've got one in particular, right, but as much as their opinions has influenced policy, uh, here's one in particular that I'm thinking about. Um, so in 2013, FSB instructed the International Association of Insurance Supervisors to create a new international capital standard for internationally active insurance groups. There seems to be universal concern among U.S.-based insurers that the current trajectory of these discussions would be bad for the U.S. market and, and U.S. policyholders. So many times when questioned, the IAIS leadership attempts to hide behind the FSB. They say, FSB told us to do this, they told us to do that. So it's, it's my view that these negotiations on an international capital standard, if they don't move in a more positive direction, that we might just need to rethink how their policy affects, how the FSB just gets affected by this. So um, but just wanted to have your thoughts on that and about going back and reviewing that, particularly with the international capital standards. You know, I, um, I served on the supervisory committee sure. for several years, but I've, I haven't uh, been involved with it for some time now, and I'm not exactly sure where that one is. But my I know that we, we had rolled out a capital requirement in, in broad form, and I'll have to come back to you on, on where that stands, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, one of the things is just it, it may have the FSB involve new directives, but just can I have you confirm or that you're willing to have, um, uh, willing to work through the FSB to redirect the IAI, excuse me, there's so many acronyms in this place, isn't there? A lot. But the IAIS, if needed, would you have the FSB review that? I, can, yes. I, can I just con confer with our people who do insurance regulation? Absolutely. I promise to come right back to you. No on. problem at all. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. <clears throat> would you yield to the chairman? Yield to the chairman. I appreciate the gentleman for, um, Yielding. Uh, Chairman Powell, I just want to revisit an area that uh, <clears throat> we had spoken about briefly during my questioning, and I'm still not sure I'm completely clear on the answer, and this has to do with the runoff of the balance sheet. Again, the monthly cap on your security roll-offs, your Treasury security roll-offs, rather, will rise to $30 billion in the report that you just released, I guess, Friday. <clears throat> Um, but according to data from the system's open market account, you don't have $30 billion of Treasury sec um, securing um, every month. So again, the, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, are you making up the shortfalls? Did I understand you to say these caps are flexible? I still don't quite understand what you intend to do when you don't have enough Treasuries that are actually maturing. Um, to hit the 30 billion. So the, the purpose of the caps was to give us a way to gradually let, you know, gradually start the runoff. Um, you're right, the caps are not going to be binding either for treasuries or MBS in most months. I think only for treasuries in the, in the big uh, um, treasury financing months. So you can think of them as not really restraining either. And so we, we didn't, we weren't saying our projections don't say we're going to roll off exactly 50 billion per month. That's not how it works. It was never how it was intended. And of course, we don't know how fast MBS are going to run off because, you know, they run off depending on where interest rates are. We do know with Treasuries, and we do know that we're we're moving right along. I mean, this, these are significant reductions this year and next year in the size of the balance sheet. So, as of a couple of weeks ago, the balance sheet, if I saw it right, was at 4.4 trillion. And by year's end, at the current rate of roll-off, it ought to be at $4 trillion. And if you kept to the pace, $3 trillion, two additional years of roll-offs, about $2 trillion four years from now. Does that sound about right? Is that the current expectation? Something like that, yeah. That's okay, but that still leaves your balance sheet roughly twice of what it was pre-crisis era. And do you expect it again to stay there, and do you not expect the demand for cash to wane as interest rates rise? 
So right now we have um, <clears throat> $2.2 trillion in non-reserve liabilities. So that's to say, and when we, when we shrink the balance sheet, what goes away is the reserves. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's the liability that goes away. So that $2.2 trillion in liabilities, you then have to add on whatever the equilibrium demand for reserves is, and it, it's probably going to be at least several hundred billion no matter what we do. So uh, that's how I get to two and a half to three. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster. Um, thank you for, for appearing here. This is an important part of communication with Congress. I, I'd like to follow up on uh, <coughs> Representative Royce's line of questioning about, uh, you know, the, the dangers of default. Uh, and I'd like to repeat his thanks to you for being involved in educating members of Congress about um, the necessity of taking seriously our, our payments on, on principal and interest. Um, and there are really two different kinds of defaults. They're defaults driven by fundamentals, when a, the, a country simply does not have the ability to repay its debt. You know, if you think about Iceland, where there were debts from the banking crisis of 700 percent of GDP, and just no way to, for the people to pay it off, much less the country. There are other ones that are just driven, self-inflicted wounds, like our, our voluntary failure. This is when a country that has more than enough money to pay its debts simply as some, for some sort of political reason refuses to, to do it. And over time, both parties have been guilty of, of abusing and weaponizing, uh, you know, the the debt limit. And I, I just want to encourage you that uh, there is a bipartisan consensus that could be assembled uh, to permanently get rid of it. It is always of being abused by whichever party is uh, in the minority. And at some point, I think everyone should step back. And, you know, you're an important part of, of opinion making in, in Washington and in financial circles. So I want to, anything you can do to encourage that to actually happen. There may be a moment when the stars align and we can just get rid of this sort of uniquely uh, dumb thing that we do of threatening to uh, not pay our debt. Now, there's also the question of, you know, is there enough money? You know, you hear often, oh, there's just not enough money uh, because of things like the publicly held debt. Uh, there's just not enough money and we have to cut Medicare and that we have to cut, you know, all the things that, you know, frankly, poor people depend on. And so I'd like to sort of go into that. The U.S. household net worth uh, is uh, sometime this year is going to go over $100 trillion, okay? Uh, $100 trillion and that publicly held debt is 75% uh, of GDP, so it's around 16, 17, I would guess. Um, and so that, you know, would you agree that there's clearly enough money in the United States to pay off our national debt? That, that will we ever reach a situation where, where the world says they are just, there is so much debt in the United States, public or private, that we simply cannot do it? We cannot cover our debts? Well, I, I wouldn't want to run the test. I, I do think there would come a time at which, it's not this time, not this time by a long shot, but there could come a time where the public, um, the global debt buying public would come to the view that we either weren't prepared to honor our debts or that we couldn't service them. But we're, we're a long way from that. Um, and, but that's different, you know, for example, in Japan where, you know, the debt's 200 percent, I think more than 200 percent of GDP, uh, you know, the markets are not concerned simply because the amount of private wealth in Japan is more than enough to cover that. The situation's different in China uh, where there's a huge amount of often unacknowledged uh, private sector debt. And when you think of what will happen when that debt fails, um, that will land first on regional banks and then, and then the main banks and basically on the government's balance sheet. And so there's a real danger in the case of China that there's just not enough money in China and enough wealth in China to cover the debt. And um, so I think, would you agree there's a fundamental difference in the United States that we actually do have the money to pay off our debts by a long margin? Uh, because of the large uh, public wealth in this country. And that really it's a, it's a political problem that we face rather than one of just not having enough money. Yes, we certainly have enough money to, to service our debts and honor them without question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but really the issue I think is servicing them gets more and more expensive as they accumulate, as the, the numbers go up. And, you know, uh, those bills are going to be borne by our children. No, I, I agree completely. And uh, the, the wisdom of lowering taxes at a time when the economy, frankly, doesn't need to be stimulated uh, is something that um, is 
Well, it's sort of elementary macroeconomics that you run a deficit when the economy's in trouble, and then when the economy recovers, you pay off the debt that you've accumulated in order to smooth things out. Um, let's, you have a section on page 14 15 of your report that you're presenting on the low inflation in advanced economies, which is something that's a widespread. Do you have any, um, any thoughts on really what's, what your, your main uh, suspicion is for why that is taking place? You know, it's been a, it's been a long run trend. Uh, inflation has been coming down um, for 25, 30 years all over the world, and it you know it, it probably has something to do with uh, with the aging of the population and with um, uh, watch the clock. Uh, you know low productivity and and those sorts of things. It probably also has to do though with um, sorry. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Poliquin. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, <clears throat> Hensling, very much, and welcome, Chair Paul. It's uh, wonderful to meet with you again, and I know it's your first time before us, and thanks for being so direct and giving us uh, the answers that, uh, uh, to the questions that we asked. Sir, I represent probably the most stunningly beautiful part of the world. It's rural Maine. And if you haven't been there, Mr. Paul, it, we are blessed with such natural beauty. We have 3,600 miles of breathtaking coastline. We have thousands and thousands of, of lakes and ponds and hundreds of miles of uh, rivers and streams. We're also called vacation land. Now, you look like a fellow that probably needs a vacation, and I'm not sure if you've booked your main vacation yet, but if you have a problem, Mr. Paul, you just call up our office and we'll help you out. Now, when you go on your main vacation, and this is a great time to go, by the way, if you like snowmobile or the summer, you're going to find throughout our district, the rural part of Maine mostly, that we have a lot of shut down factories and mills. When I was a kid growing up, we had maybe two dozen paper mills. We have six left, and they're healthy. And you look at a lot of our textile and, and tanneries and, uh, and shoe factories, mostly shut down. And we've, in many cases, Mr. Powell, done that to ourselves with trade agreements that were unfair and hurt. Uh, our workers, high taxes that didn't allow us to be competitive. I know we've partially fixed that problem uh, back in December uh, with passing the tax cuts. And then costly regulations. Now, I'm sure you're familiar, Mr. Paul, with a Competitive Enterprise Institute uh, computation that says, and I summarize, about $1.9 trillion a year cost is paid by our is paid by our own and through them pass through to some of our con consumers. $1.9 trillion cost mm. just to comply with federal regulations. Mm. Not state and local, just federal. So is it fair to say, Mr. Powell, that unnecessary and costly regulatory burdens hurt the economy's growth and hurt job creation? Is that a fair thing to say? I think it is, yes. Okay, and would you look at the past year 2017 and up until now, when you have the economy growing at roughly three or so percent as compared to about 1.7 percent the last roughly eight to ten years, is part of that increased economic growth and more jobs and fatter paychecks the result of repealing unnecessary and expensive regulations? You know, intuitively, I would guess that it is, but it's very hard to pin that down. It's very hard to... to I think anybody, it. with all due respect, Mr. Paul, who's run a business as I have, realizes that if it's less burdensome to run my business and sell product or services, then I'm going to be more competitive. I'll be able to hire more people and do better. Let me give you an example. This morning I met with uh, about 100 folks from our credit unions in Maine. And these are wonderful people that are spending more time or too much time dealing with compliance as compared to pushing money in the community so businesses can grow and hire more workers. Can you commit today, Mr. Powell, that you will do everything humanly possible within your purview to make sure that the regulatory burden for our small financial institutions are controlled and hopefully repealed? I will make you that commitment. You will or will not? Will. Thank you, sir. And have you taken a look at Senate Bill 2155, which deals with part of the Choice Act that we sent over to the Senate, and they're dealing with issues, in particular with small uh, credit unions and community <laughs> banks, uh, that help them deal with the regulatory burden. Have you taken a look at that, sir? I'm not so good on the numbers of the bills. Would, does this bill have a name? Is uh, it, is this... it is, I believe, Mr. Crapo's bill. Yes, no, I, I am familiar with that bill. Great, and you're supportive of that, I take it, because it deals exactly with what you and I are talking about. So it's a big bill, there's a lot in there. I think it's a very constructive enterprise, and I think the aspects of it that you're talking about, and I certainly think are, are sensible. Perfect, let's move on. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul, I appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit about what Mr. Foster was talking about, and I, I, this is just wonderful, talking about the national debt. 
We have $21 trillion, and Chairman Hensling is very good to put that number up every time we come in here. You can see it on both sides of the room. I'm looking at it, every, and I tell you, it makes my belly sick. Now, we've had other folks in the last administration, Mr. Paul, that have come here and say, well, this is no big deal, Bruce. $21 trillion in national debt. I used to be the state treasurer in Maine. And I'll tell you, we knew how to balance our books and spend only what we took in. And when I was there, the debt clock was unwinding. So now we have about $240, $245 billion per year <clears throat> interest payments on that debt. Mr. Paul, do you take a different tack from the folks that were here earlier, the last administration? Do you think this is a problem? Do I think this is a... That yes, there's $21 trillion in debt. Well, yeah, I think, I think we're not on a sustainable fiscal path, and I think... I would agree with that. So we can agree that this is a, a problem. Uh, with that said, sir, my second day here in Congress, I co-sponsored, the first bill I co-sponsored was a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution to finally force Washington to live within its means, start balancing our books, and start paying down the debt. Do you, sir, think that's a good idea? Not a supporter of the balanced budget. I'm a supporter of, sustained, uh, of a sustainable fiscal path. Mr. Chairman, time I'm going to come back to Mr. Powell on that at some time. time. Time of the gentleman Thank has you, expired. Sir. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Beatty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly, as one would expect with you being the chair of the Federal Reserve, that the questions would be centered um, around economic projections, economic <clears throat> developments, financial stability, monetary policy. Uh, but I'm going to keep in my true form of asking you the same question that I've asked everyone uh, who has sat in that seat. Uh, are you familiar with Section 342 of Dodd-Frank? Yes, ma'am, I am. Okay, the Omni. So with that, the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion can you tell me in your short time, which I recognize, but you also have uh, almost a half decade of being chairman of that board, tell me what you're proud about that's under your leadership with Amway. I'll be glad to. So uh, a couple of things. First, uh, I, as I mentioned, I've been involved in uh, my, now my seventh Reserve Bank presidential search, and I think in every case we've been able to expand the universe of diverse candidates and, uh, and uh, select diverse candidates, too, and I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, I think the Reserve Banks do, do a good job, by the way, on this. I think at the board, Chair Yellen started a group of, uh, a group of us to meet regularly and try to advance uh, diversity and inclusion agendas at the board. I was an enthusiastic So let me ask you, so who is your Amwe person? Sheila Clark. Okay, and do you think you can increase your numbers as uh, Chairman Yellen had worked on rising them, uh, and, and while it was a fair job under her, I asked her the same question, and she admitted it could be better. So while I'm saying you, the entity, has done something, I, I want to hear how we can do more, because it's still not at bragging rights, in, in my opinion. So I want you to think about that. We have a lot of people who are in the audience today in, in green T-shirts who represent many of the people who I represent in the 3rd Congressional District, <clears throat> many of them women, many of them women of color, uh, who also are concerned. The only difference with them is they put the people face, the human resources, on the same monetary policy. And all the questions my colleagues on the other side have been asking you about numbers. Have you met with these individuals? Yes, I have. Okay, and can you share with me some positive progress <clears throat> that you or the people who work with you um, are doing with them? Um, so we met with a, with a group with the green t-shirts uh, a, a couple of years back. I just wanted to tell us about what was going on in their communities, and frankly, I thought it was a proud day. You know, we, we sat there and listened to what was going on in their communities, and it was very respectful, and uh, it, it, was, it was useful. We also, you know, have other meetings. Would someone on your staff be able to send me a report so I would have something in writing to know some benchmarks? Because I know in meeting with them and their representatives, they have specific <clears throat> questions that they want to see, and they're asking about interest rates, and they're asking about how we can help uh, improve the economy for what we call working uh, middle-class Americans. So, so let me put it in a different way. I'd like to get a report 
from your staff sharing with me since you've had a meeting what type of commitments or things you're going to work on. So I'd, I'd like to have that. Secondly, let me move to a, another financial question. I noticed in your report that there wasn't anything about the stock market. Can you tell me if you think the stock market is one of the um, best or better uh, indicators of the strength of the economy or the strength of the financial conditions uh, for everyday Americans? And I ask you this because a lot of my colleagues on the other side uh, have been bragging uh, a lot about the stock market and how the stock market is going up. So there was one reference in there about the recent volatility. I don't think we called out the stock market by name, but that was kind of what we were talking about. Um, you know, we don't manage to the stock market. We manage to stable prices and maximum employment. The stock market enters into our thinking. It's, a, it's an important place for businesses to raise um, capital, it's an important place for investors to invest. So is that a yes or no, in your opinion? In my opinion, is it, is it what? Is it an important indicator of the overall state of the yes. economy? Well, I, I mean, the, I think the general thing is the stock market is not the economy, but it's a factor. It plays a factor. It's a role, and would you role. say that only 50 percent uh, of Americans own right. stock markets, so the other 50 percent who may be women and minorities don't? That's right, yeah. The time of the gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for being here today and spending so much of your day with us. We really appreciate it. But, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's important that we have this dialogue. <clears throat> I want to I want to talk about something I don't know that's been discussed much here today, but it's something that's very important for me, especially spending over 20 years in the IT industry dealing with securing data. And that's... Uh, something that has, has been on the mind of most Americans, and that's cybersecurity and protecting uh, the data that of, of Americans. And one of the, the areas of interest of mine, and I've, and I've stated this in almost every hearing that we've had on this topic, um, when I was in the military working intelligence, I worked on the technology side of it. And of course, when you're dealing with the nation's secrets, there's a huge responsibility to protect that information. And we had a, a simple principle. And that principle was you don't have to protect what you don't have, which means if you don't absolutely need it, get rid of it. Otherwise, it becomes a risk. And I'm sure you know that the, the Federal Board of Governors has experienced more than 50 data breaches since 2011. And of course, that's, that's very alarming. Um, given how much data the government collects, and not only collects itself, but requires private sector business to collect, which means they have to protect it as well. And your, your predecessor, Chair Yellen, told me when I asked these type of questions that the Fed follows the NIST security, cybersecurity framework and was working on minimizing access to sensitive data. I'd like to follow up. What, what are your what are you working on and to strengthen the Fed's cybersecurity uh, profile and to protect the data that you have? Thank you. Um, so I'm just getting started on this. And uh, so, um, you know, it's, we, I'm going to place a high priority. I think Chair Yellen and others did before her, too. Uh, we need to uh, protect the sensitive information that we do have, and we don't need to collect sensitive information that we don't need. That's a, that's a very Thank fair you. point. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think we've done a good job. We can certainly do better, and uh, you know, it's it's going to be a high priority. Um, I, and I appreciate that, and that's one of the areas. And I'm glad to hear you say that um, you, you're looking at uh, disposing of or, or not keeping certain data unless you need it, because that's something I think that we overlook as a government, because access to information is power. But when you have it, you have to secure it. Um, transition over into a, another area that we've been dealing with here and uh, understand that you're supportive of some of the regulatory relief proposals that we have pending in Congress, such as increasing the SIFI threshold to $250 billion from the current $50 billion. And while I believe that Mr. Lukemeyer's SIFI designation uh, reform bill takes a more thoughtful approach to measuring and, <clears throat> and designating systemic risk, I think it's still a, a step in the right direction. Can you, can you, kind of help explain why banks under $250 billion in assets don't pose a systemic risk to the economy? Um, as a general matter, um, banks under $250 billion are more engaged in the traditional business of banking, less complex activities, and of course they're much smaller, they have smaller footprints. I mean, and the, the way the, uh, the Senator Crapo's bill works is 
we would still have the ability to create a framework to look below 250 down to 100 billion institutions to identify places where perhaps uh, enhanced prudential standards might need to be applied. Um, but uh, so that's the way the bill works. But I, I think our own our view has been uh, that that combination of raising the threshold and giving us the ability to go below it in cases where needed gives us the tools that we need. And, and from what I understand, even some of the authors of uh, the Dodd Frank bill are saying that 50 billion was the, the wrong threshold, and we need to adjust it. So I appreciate that. One last question: um, What are what is the Fed doing? with the private sector on faster payment technologies. Are you engaged in that in, in, at all? I'm glad you asked. I was right in the middle of that uh, in my prior life at the Fed. Uh, so this, this really came out of um, the, the thought that uh, we're falling behind other countries in faster, um, you know, widely available mobile payments and that sort of thing. So we really, really convened a group of uh, companies and consumer groups and regulators and customers and everything around the table and tried to make progress toward, you know, toward uh, faster mobile payments. And I, I'm really proud of what we've done. Uh, Esther George at the Kansas City Fed uh, has had the lead on that in several, for the last several years and has done a great job at it. So um, it's something we're, we're continuing to work on. We think it's very important. All right. And, uh, and thank you for your leadership. I'm looking forward to working with you as, uh, over the next few years. Thank you. I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Heck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Powell, congratulations on assuming this incredible and awesome responsibility for the country. I'm going to ask you the same question I've asked each of your predecessors since I've been a member of this committee. When does America get a raise? And the reason I'm asking that question is because we've obviously been through a protracted period of time in which wage growth has been fairly stagnant. So before you answer, sir, I know you're probably going to make some indication of the uptick in the latest report to wage growth of 2.9%. And I just want to qualify your response by reminding you that that 2.9% was probably impacted by some transitory or one-time bonus payments. Uh, and if you disaggregate the data between supervisory and non-supervisory employees, non-supervisory employees didn't get anywhere near 2.9%, was quite a bit below that. And 2.9% even in and of itself, despite how encouraging we may or may not put it in the context of the last 18 months or so, is significantly below modern historical averages of closer to 4%. I'm really interested in when is this economy going to function and grow in a fashion that enables Americans to get a meaningful raise? Um, so over time, wages should grow in keeping with basically the sum of inflation and increased productivity. So if we assume, assume inflation is going to be around 2 percent, it really comes down to productivity. Productivity since the financial crisis has averaged output per hour, has averaged increase of about half a percent. And so, and if you think about wages have been increasing at about 2.5 percent. So that's why, and before the crisis, wages were increasing at full employment maybe 3.5%, and that's because productivity was 1.5%. So we really need, if we want wages to go up on a sustainable basis over a long period of time, and that is what we want, uh, we need to have more productivity. And that's, unfortunately, that's not the things we have the tools for. But, but that really but is. But is that true, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair? It seems to me that they're not unrelated to the degree that you keep your foot off the brake and allow unemployment to continue to fall, and I'm going to return to this issue and some, some things you've said on the record in the past about whether or not we should be looking at unemployment rates or wage growth as a measure of full employment <clears throat> per se, but to the degree that we keep our foot off the brake and allow U3 or U6 or pick your measure to continue to drop and continue to create pressures in the economy for wage growth to continue. Does that not in and of itself incentivize businesses and employers to invest in labor saving devices, read here, improve productivity? Is it not possible that improved wages themselves can help lead to improved productivity, which can create a virtuous cycle with wage growth over time? Yes, and, and that, um, that is uh, exactly what we hope is happening right now. So, uh, so, you're, so you're committing to keep your foot off the brake. <laughs> uh, when I was getting ready for this hearing, I went back and read something that 
you said in your very first year on the FOMC committee, uh, at the very first meeting, one of the bank presidents mentioned tighter labor markets, and you noted that you haven't seen anything in the wage data yet to support that. <clears throat> and it struck me as interesting because it got me into thinking about U3 and U6 and my frustration with both and how it's been, I think, two and a half years since we hit the, de the supposed definition of full employment, yet U3 keeps dropping and the definition of full employment keeps chasing it. And it made me wonder, uh, as it relates to what you said earlier, why don't we just, why don't we just use wage data to help define what full employment is? Well, we use it as, as a factor to look at. But I, look, I, I think it's important to, to see, though, that you know, for a long time, uh, there was slack in the labor market, and, and that argued for continuing to support um, lower unemployment. We've reached the point where the risks are really two-sided now, and we need to keep that into account because if we do get behind and uh, the market does, the, the economy does overheat, we don't see that now, I hasten to add, but if that does happen, then we'll have to raise rates faster, and, and that raises the chances of a recession, and recessions tend to hit vulnerable populations the most. So that's why we're raising, rate, raising rates on a gradual path. We're trying to balance the risk of of um, you know, getting inflation up to 2% with the risk of, of uh, the, the economy overheating. Fair enough, Mr. Chair, but I would only observe that you tap the brakes at the, at the expense of the people who have, over a long period of time, not received a raise. Time of the Thank gentleman you, has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Tinney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Powell. I, uh, Appreciate your long uh, time here, and I, I think I'm the end of the line here for you today. So just have a couple of quick questions that deal with uh, sort of uh, in the weeds policy. And first would like to ask you about the Federal Open Markets Committee and their role in determining uh, interest on excess reserves. On, uh, back in 2006, Congress passed the Financial Services Regulatory Relief Act, which authorized the Federal Reserve to pay interest on excess reserves at reserve banks. However, when the bill got amended, um, the uh, Federal Reserve in determining those interest rates were, was left to the Board of Governors and not to the entire uh, Federal Open Markets Committee. And we know this is a valuable tool using this, uh, the entire committee to determine uh, monetary policy. Uh, my question for you is, would you support an initiative or legislation that would um, give the full role of determining what um, the excess reserve amount, interest, excess interest on reserve, interest on excess to an entire expanded FMO, FOMC and the, uh, the Federal Reserve. I, I guess yeah. I would say this is less of a problem than it seems to be. Remember, okay. the, the full FOMC decides uh, the range for the federal funds rate, and the, the um, IOER is only set at the top of that range. And so it, it really is the, 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 the voting members of the FOMC who decide that. So. It's not, um, it, would have been, it would have been a reasonable decision for Congress to do that. I, I, I'm always loath to support changes to the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve Act because that opens up the act. But I would say as a practical matter, this is not a problem that we need to solve because there is no difference between the two things. So, uh, would, you be, so would you be a supportive or not supportive of legislation that would allow the uh, district presidents basically to, to weigh in on that decision as well? Yeah, I, and if not, why not? I don't think we're looking for legislation. Okay. Obviously, we always always like less legislation, but in, in this case, we're looking for uh, more stakeholders to be in part of the decision process. I think. So I, I think that the real decision that's made is the one that the bank presidents do take part in. It's the one it's, that sets the range for the federal funds rate. They, they they make that decision with us under the law. This is a, just an implementing thing. And I, if I thought it was a if I thought it was really unfair or a problem, then I would support a change. But I, I don't really think it is a problem. It's less so than it would appear. Okay. It's been expressed by them that they'd be interested in having input on that. I just wanted, if you would consider supportive of that. Uh, let me go to the next thing, and that would be the, uh, the Federal Open Markets Committee blackout period and uh, how you feel about that and whether we could uh, restore some transparency to that period, whether it's necessary to go through with that part just so we know we have an ability to find out what's going on during that period, uh, that eight times a year when the committee is meeting where we don't have an opportunity to hear from the stakeholders. 
I want to look at what you're proposing. You know, okay. Um, we, um, the whole idea of that period is that we don't speak publicly uh, to market participants about, or anybody about monetary policy during that period. Uh, and that gives us a chance to keep our mouths shut for a while and let, mm -hmm. uh, let us get in a room and, and do our thinking. And then we come out of that at the end of the FOMC meeting, make an announcement. And then there's a day or two. And then, then people can give speeches and that kind of thing. Do you think there would be uh, anywhere in there on, on certain types, parts of the policy that would be uh, maybe better off with more transparency on certain issues? Obviously, there's some that you would like to keep in, in, the, in the negotiating process, but others where we could at least speak on and know it was going to come out at that point? I, um, you know, I, th I think um, I'd be happy to discuss this with you offline. Let's, okay. Why don't, we, why don't we commit to do that? I, I don't Thank you. I know I'd love to talk. It just I have a bill of legislation that would just offer a little more transparency in that aspect of it, just so mm -hmm. not, not to eliminate the blackout period, but to minimize some of the issues that were, are not allowed to be re revealed during that blackout well, period. I'm concerned that, that um, when we're actually thinking about what to do at the next meeting, that we kind of take a step away from our public conversations. Um, that's that's seen as generally has seen been seen by us as a, as a healthy thing. But okay, one us. one other uh, qu quick question on another topic. Um, the Wall Street Journal recently reported that two monetary policy specialists will serve as your senior advisors. <clears throat> you may recall that our House Pass Form Act, the Federal Oversight Reform Modernization Act, provides for each Federal Reserve Board governor to also have access to two senior advisors. Uh, Chairman Powell, uh, would you uh, be uh, willing to allow uh, two senior advisors to help a more diverse set of perspectives to your committee's monetary policy deliberations? I do remember that provision of the bill, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think look, the, the, the board has changed really since mm -hmm. in the time since I've been there. We're back to where every governor has one or two advisors. So. And we don't need legislation on that. We okay, so that's something you'd support. Time, time of the gentlelady has expired. Thank you. Chair now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Powell. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, before I get into my prepared questions, I have two follow-ups uh, to previous questions. One, uh, Chairman Barr um, asked you about uh, intervention uh, in terms of selling assets. Uh, in a particular scenario where the yield curve may become inverted, uh, whether monetary policy might be appropriate up to and including selling assets in order to prevent a yield curve inversion. And just for clarity, if, if yield curve inversions are generally seen as bad, why wouldn't intervention to prevent a yield curve inversion be seen as good? Well, um, so, in terms of yield curve inversions, I think that the history is what it is, but it really is a history of times when the Fed, to some extent, has gotten behind and had to raise rates really fast. And that's not where we are right now. I think most observers of this environment don't see that problem. And so if you look at, uh, you know, projections of the likelihood of, of a recession the next year or so, they're very low. They're, they're as no, low as they normally are. So I don't look at the current yield curve situation as a problem needing solution. I also go into the, the, the issue of selling assets, though. I really like our current, our current plan of uh, allowing these uh, uh, MBS and Treasury securities to roll off passively. The market has accepted it. You know, I'd have a high bar for wanting to change something that's working very well. And you know, four years is not a long time. We'll be back to some kind of new normal within four years. I think my my strong prior would be to, to let let the successfully announced and created uh, program just run its course. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, also, uh, Chairman Henserling asked you about the IOER payments, and uh, I think your answer was that they're constrained by commercially, uh, commercial rates, uh, so things that are available in the marketplace. But I would note that uh, an interest rate consists uh, generally of two parts. One's time value of money, and the other is default risk. And presumably, IOERs uh, don't have a default risk, so I'm not sure that's the right metric. Uh, would you care to comment on that? So what the law, I think, says is uh, that we, we shouldn't pay interest on reserves uh, that's greater than the general level of short-term interest rates. That's, that's what But those short-term interest rates, so I, I guess I see a, a perhaps a need for clarification on the law because those short-term interest rates contain time value of money risk but also default risk. 
whereas IOER does not contain default risk. So the real, the real alternative for a financial institution in the market isn't, uh, isn't a one-for-one one rate. It's if they make uh, loans out in the marketplace, they inherently have default risk that the IOER does not have. You know, we're, we're, again, we're trying to manage, what we're trying to use that tool to do is to set short-term interest rates uh, for, the, for the public. So, um, and those, a lot of those will have a, a, a credit risk component. These short-term interest rates really don't have a big one, though, particularly repo, which is secured by treasuries. Correct. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do have a question about the two roles of the Fed, two basic roles as a regulator and as a monetary policy uh, entity. Uh, would that be consistent with how you see the structure of the Fed? Yes. Okay. And so to understand the internal operations, do you, do you actually track the budget between the two activities separately? I mean, are there people that are generally involved in regulatory activity and then a different body of people that are generally involved in monetary policy? You know, each different divisions do have different uh, budgets, and we do look at it from a functional basis, but it's, it's, uh, it's pretty uh, intertwined, as a matter of fact. You know, we do call upon uh, the, what we learn in the, in the supervisory and regulatory space, we do get a lot of input. The board gets briefed on that all the time. It informs our monetary policy, and I think our, our knowledge of the transmission mechanism also informs supervision. So there's quite a, little, quite a lot of intertwining there. It's not a, not a clean separation. Okay, but internally there's already at least some level of uh, separate budget for, you know, the activities involving regulators. Um, and, and I guess my particular curiosity involves a bill that we've uh, put together called H.R. 4755. It's the Federal Reserve Regulatory Oversight Act, and this would put the regulatory component of the Federal Reserve on appropriations, um, which would be, to me, a compromise position, because we could propose putting the entire Federal Reserve on appropriations. This would be, the purpose would be to focus on the regulatory side so that all the standard strings attached to an executive agency uh, that's, at, that's engaged in rulemaking applied to the regulatory side of uh, the Federal Reserve in the same way that others do. Um, and, and so I hope that we can uh, enact that later in the year. My time has expired. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now rec uh, recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, and informs all members that a vote is currently pending on the floor. Gentleman is recognized. Well, I appreciate you being here and I've heard uh, great things about the testimony that you've given so far. And so looking forward to the opportunity to continue to interact with you and work with you in supporting the, the Fed's stated goals. I wanted to ask some questions that I hear a lot about in district, which is, you know, as we continue to see unemployment tick lower and lower, one of the questions I get a lot is, why aren't we seeing more wage growth across the country and what's constraining some of the wage growth? Um, that may be happening as we tend to push down unemployment, whether that reflects on whether the Phillips curve is theory is somehow incorrect or whether it's kinked in a nonlinear curve or and what your views are on that. So there are kind of two ways to think about it. Yeah. One is that for wages to go up sustainably, yeah. you need higher productivity. We've right. had very low productivity since the crisis and it's, it's averaging about 0.5% per mm -hmm. year. And so we need to get that up if we want wages to go up sustainably. Right. But maybe more relevant to your question is, as, as you get um, this, this close to full employment, mm -hmm. you would think that there will be some, some tightness in the labor market. You would think wages would be mm -hmm. getting bid, bid up. And you know, we're, we're going to be looking at that as, an, as one of many indicators of where the natural rate of unemployment is. Yeah. Um, and I, I wouldn't say it's a great mystery, but uh, I would have expected to see uh, more increases in wages, and frankly, I do expect to see more increases in wages in the next year or so. Mm -hmm. I know one of the, the theories that I think the Fed has put out quite a bit is that there's a called a shadow labor market, right? There's a great number of people that aren't currently participating in the labor market, either looking for employment or currently employed, that might be tempted to come back in or lured back in. Do you still think that's the case, that higher wages or just more employment opportunities might lead to more people getting to the workforce, or is there some sort of decay in their skill set if they've been unemployed for a period of time that might lead to them not being able to participate meaningfully in the workforce and need some help getting back into it. You know, we've seen um, we've seen the labor force participation rate go sideways yeah. now for four straight years, and right. that is actually a big gain against what is a downward trend due to aging and other mm -hmm. things. So I think we've seen some of that. We've seen people either not leaving or, right. or coming back in the labor force as it's gotten tighter. Right. How much more of that can there be? You know, um, I hope there's a lot more, but. Uh, 
I'm there's still really some sure statistics about working age population individuals, though, that are less employed or less likely to be looking for employment than they were maybe 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and so I think I, I've certainly heard the demographic argument made quite a bit. I think you made it in one of our private meetings before, is that holding on to current labor force participation is actually a gain once you look at those that uh, demographically would be falling out. And so, but it seems like working age population individuals are still somewhat challenged to get back into the workforce. Have you guys seen some of that or seen some some anecdotal or statistical evidence as to what that might be leading to or what the cause might be? So actually, um, labor force participation mm -hmm. by prime age workers yeah. is still more than a full percentage point below where it was before the crisis. Right. So that is the other, with thing, two things where you're getting a signal that there might be more slack are wages mm -hmm. and prime age labor force participation. Right. It's the other place. There are many other ones that suggest that we're at or above full employment, but so, you know, it may be that, that those people, that there are some portion of those people can come mm -hmm. back in. It may be that it's mostly structural. Right. The only way to know is to um, is to find out. So I think mm -hmm. we're you know with with relatively low unemployment, we're close to full employment mm -hmm. now. We should be finding out whether we can keep these people, get them back in the labor force. Right. Does that imply, and I've read in other comments that you've made, and please don't let me misconstrue them because um, I, I don't want to mischaracterize what you're trying to say, that there might be a tolerance to continue to see more and more tightening in the labor market and maybe run above historical average inflation in a goal to try to drive more wage growth and get more people back into the workforce? Is that a fair characteristic of what you've said before? or? You know, I, I think we're engaged in a process of discovering the natural yeah. rate. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, you know, I think uh, the median SEP participant says it's in the mid fours. That sounds about right to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of inflation, you know, we're certainly not, we haven't said that we're seeking uh, inflation above target. What, mm -hmm. what we say is that, uh, you know, we would look at persistent deviations from inflation, both above, above and below target, mm -hmm. as being uh, undesirable, and we'll conduct policy to move policy to move uh, yeah. inflation back to target. When you think about, just one last question, maybe more generic, when you think about the economy today, do you think about monetary policy mm -hmm. today and, and maybe its future as well, what keeps you up at night? What are you most worried about with regard to the economy, like you mentioned, productivity, monetary policy? You know, I, I think <clears throat> right now the economy is in, you know, the best shape it's been in a while, and that's true around the globe. We're having right. a moment of global growth. It's uh, it's great to see. So we have the problems associated with strong growth, and and that that's that's a great great relief. And my you know my hope is that we can sustain that yeah. for as long as possible. Understood. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The time of the gentleman has expired. There being no further members in the queue, I'd like to thank the witness for his testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witness to the chair. Chairman Powell, I would ask that you uh, respond to this as soon as you are able. This hearing now stands adjourned.